On May 18th of 1935, George and Laura Lorius joined their friends Albert and Tilly Haberer on the cross-country road trip of a lifetime. From their home in southern Illinois, the group planned on driving across 2,000 miles of plains and desert before finally finishing up on the coast of California, and by May 21st, they had arrived in the small town of Vaughn, New Mexico. After piling out of George Lorius's Nash sedan, the two couples checked into the Vaughn Hotel before sending off several postcards to friends and family. Then, after a small dinner at a local diner, the group retired to their rooms for the night before continuing west the following morning. In their postcards, the group seemed to be in high spirits and reported nothing untoward occurring during their most recent drive. But after the couples continued driving west on the morning of the 22nd, neither was ever heard from again. The morning of May 26th that the Lorius's car was found abandoned in the business district of Dallas, Texas. The vehicle's keys were still in the ignition, the gas tank was full, and numerous postcards lay in the passenger seat. But there was no sign of any of the Illinois road trippers. Gas station receipts confirmed that Mr. Lorius had purchased fuel in a place called Socorro on May 23rd, but after that, their fate was anyone's guess. The following week, the couple's families were notified of their disappearance, and an official investigation was launched. Police initially believed that the absence of $400 worth of traveler's checks indicated that a violent robbery had taken place. However, investigators soon discovered that the couple's car had been involved in a minor accident shortly after arriving in Socorro. Since the accident could have angered someone enough to do harm to the road trippers, police began questioning the handful of witnesses to the crash. Yet instead of describing the vehicle as containing two middle-aged couples, witnesses stated that the lone occupant was a young man with dark-colored hair. Detectives managed to track the vehicle from the scene of the accident to a small local repair shop. Mechanics changed a tire on the vehicle and completed other minor repairs, then whoever was driving the car paid with one of George Lorius's traveler's checks. Detectives then followed the trail of cash checks to a motel in El Paso, and then to Dallas, which is where the vehicle was found abandoned on May 26th. The investigation briefly stalled until June 29th, when a report came in of a small desert bushfire on the outskirts of Albuquerque. The fire department arrived to discover a piece of burning luggage. Inside were the smoldering belongings of George and Laura Lorius. With the man responsible for the couple's disappearance still actively disposing of their belongings, law enforcement rushed into action in the hopes they might still be recovered alive. The FBI headed up a multi-agency task force which searched rivers, lakes, mine shafts, wells, and numerous spots around the desert. Yet despite the vast reach of the well-staffed search teams, not a trace of the missing couples could be found. Unable to apprehend a suspect, Detectives found themselves diverted to other investigations, and the case eventually went cold. But as recently as 2010, the case files are still revisited by various state police officers, each hoping for a flash of inspiration. According to one such officer, Agent Norman Rhodes, the case has never been officially closed, but the low probability of it being solved means that the New Mexico State Police can rarely afford to pay it any mind. Yet despite the perceived difficulties of the case, Agent Rhodes has since made it his personal mission to discover what happened to the four Illinois road trippers. Rhodes stated that perhaps his most daunting task has been trying to locate the remains of the road trippers' bodies, which are most likely nothing more than desiccated bones today. It will also be no small feat to locate the couple's killer, who will have probably died of old age since the crime took place, but such a prospect hasn't seemed to have deterred Agent Rhodes. Perhaps his zeal comes from the ongoing support and assistance provided by Laura Lorius's great-niece, Barbara Ashcraft, who is desperate to see the family mystery finally solved. When pressed on what her theories regarding his relative's fate, Ashcraft believes they were murdered in Vaughn, possibly in the very same cafe that they had their breakfast in on the morning of their disappearance. The purpose of their stop in Vaughn was so that the Loriuses could visit an old friend who just so happened to live there, but it's unclear whether or not this friend actually met with them. 
Not only that, but in 1963, a private investigator named Walter Duke received a letter from a woman claiming to have witnessed the murders. The woman said she watched the two couples being escorted into the basement of a cafe, and that she had later heard that they'd been robbed, murdered, and then buried in wet concrete. The tip has led Barbara Ashcraft to suggest that the investigation should focus on the concrete slabs lining the site of the former Vaughn Hotel, but Agent Norman Rhodes has another theory. After combing over stacks of reports in the State Police Records Division, Rhodes has created a timeline of events and interviews that's an incredible 141 pages long. According to him, two postcards in particular have convinced Rhodes that the couples actually left Vaughn on the morning of May 22nd with the intention of driving to Albuquerque via Santa Fe. A postcard marked May 22nd was mailed to Albuquerque and a clerk at Albuquerque's Sturgis Hotel told investigators that the couples visited her hotel that afternoon to ask about renting rooms. Agent Rhodes believed that the couples rented one of the smaller rooms at this hotel so that each of them could take a shower and intended to travel over to Gallup by nightfall. Yet shortly after leaving town, they suffered their run-in with their mysterious killer. It's very possible that the couples misjudged the distance to Albuquerque and had ended up driving around in the dark when it's much harder to properly navigate. Rhodes believed that this is how they became vulnerable to a potential predator, and that the couple simply misplaced their trust in someone who brutally and violently betrayed them. Although spotted by a handful of witnesses, the police are no closer to identifying the man who took George Lorius' car as they were almost 90 years ago. But even if this person was identified, they're probably in no fit state to answer questions about something that occurred back in 1935, and it's unlikely that there's any surviving forensic evidence. The truth behind the disappearance of George Lorius, Laura Lorius, and their friends Albert and Tilly might well have vanished along with them, and the mystery of how four regular, wholesome people simply disappeared one day is unlikely to ever be unraveled. Back in my early 20s, me and my bestie went through a phase of going on road trips every other weekend, and this one time, we planned on driving all the way to San Francisco with a few stops in between. So first day, we're about four hours into the drive, and we're going along I-70 in Colorado, coming up on the state line. Around 8pm, we pull over at a gas station, and while I'm fueling up, I notice these other two girls pumping gas. They looked around the same age as us, like they could have been on a road trip just like we were, but just behind them, at the other pump, was this guy. He looked like he was in his late 30s or early 40s, and the girls can't see him doing it, but he's just staring at these two girls with a blank expression on his face, eyes darting back and forth between them as they pumped their gas. It was really creepy, but after a while, the guy went back to seeing to his car and... I went inside of the gas station to grab some snacks as fuel for our night drive up to Salt Lake City. When I walk back out of the gas station, the girls are just leaving in their car, and when I take a look around for the creepy truck guy, he's staring at their car again. Then, in a move that seemed so full of bad intention that it actually freaked me out, he suddenly jumped in his truck, then went speeding off in the same direction as the girls did. I'm like, no. If that happened to me and my friend, I'd want someone to have our back too, even if it was just to trail us while dialing 911 or whatever. By the time I caught up with them, the guy was riding their butt with his high beams on, flashing his lights every so often like he was trying to get them to pull over or something. Then right there in front of me, the guy speeds up around the side of the girl's car. Then I can see him leaning over in his seat so he can shout stuff over to them. The next thing I know... The girl's car starts to pull over and I'm thinking, oh god, no, don't do it. But the guy in the truck just passes them and keeps going, maybe because he saw me in his rear view and knew that he couldn't do anything with witnesses. Then me and my friend also pull over right up behind where the girls are parked and after putting my hazard lights on, we got out to see if they were okay. And they were not okay. The guy was so obviously not a cop but apparently he'd been yelling at the girls that he was a deputy and that if they didn't pull over, they'd be going to jail. That was when they decided to actually do as he was asking, 
and if they pulled over without us being behind them, there's no telling what would have happened that night. I think it says everything that the guy just fled once we realized that they weren't alone. He must have known that his little cop impersonation wouldn't have stood up to scrutiny, but then he obviously wasn't planning on keeping his little charade up if he actually got the girls to pull over. If he'd have gotten his hands on them, they would have been in a whole world of hurt. We told the girls that they were welcome to stick behind us until we reached the next gas station or any place they could stop and link up with the cops to tell them what happened. They took us up on the offer and we parted ways not long after, but not after some very grateful hugs. Stuff like that made me wonder just how safe me and my friend were. Someone else had gotten unlucky that time, but how long would it be until it was us that had attracted the attention of some highway psycho? We tried to cut down on the amount of time we spent driving at night after that. It always made it much easier to get around, what with the roads being less busy, but I think we can all agree that there's something about the darkness that makes creeps feel more comfortable being creeps. There's a wilder point in there too, and it's something that'll always scare me as a young woman. We can take all the safety precautions we want, go on as many take-back-the-night marches as we can organize. Heck, we can go ahead and carry a gun if we're so inclined, but we'll never be able to stop people wanting to hurt other people. Some are born that way, some are made that way, and sometimes, when they really want to inflict pain or misery, there's really nothing anyone can do about it. Over the 10 years that I have been driving shipments across the country, I've seen a lot of things. Some of them were truly beautiful sights, while others might end up haunting you for the rest of your life. For instance, you never really know what to expect when you enter a truck stop or gas station bathroom. On a good day, the restroom might be recently cleaned out and is entirely empty aside from you, but on a bad day, let's just say they can get pretty bad. I'll never forget the time that I was driving through Louisiana, making my way to Florida to drop off a shipment. At the time, I had been doing a lot of overnight driving and sleeping during the daytime. It was a really efficient method for a while because of how empty the roads were after midnight. I never really had to worry about a traffic jam. My biggest issue on those night drives was either one or two things. One, where am I going to stop for food? After 11 p.m. it becomes increasingly harder to find a fast food place that's open. And the second issue was often the more serious of the two. Where can I find a good place to use the bathroom? That night, I was mainly dealing with the second problem. And at this point, it was around 1 in the morning and it started looking like I was going to have to pull off on the side of the road and run into the woods to use the bathroom really fast. But luckily, I was saved by a sign. The sign pointed out that there was a Shell gas station half a mile down the road, and according to the sign, it also had a truck stop attached to it, which told me that there was a restroom there. I continued to make my way down the road toward the gas station, and when I finally made it there, I was surprised. Most of the shell stations that I would stop at were larger than most gas stations, especially if they supposedly had a truck stop attached to them, but not this time. As I pulled into the parking lot, I saw one of the smallest, poorly lit gas stations I had ever seen, and after taking a second look, I could tell that this gas station had been abandoned for at least a year or two. I thought about continuing on down the street, but I decided I couldn't wait any longer. I parked the truck off to the side of the parking lot and got ready to hop down from my seat when I hesitated. Something struck me as odd about this gas station, aside from the fact that it looked like there was no one around for miles. There was also this strange, distinct smell in the air. All I could do was pray that it wasn't coming from the restrooms. I continued to get out of my truck and lock the door behind me as I made my way toward the gas station. And as I got closer to the building, I kept my eyes glued to the floor to make sure I didn't step in anything. That was when I noticed a slight discoloration in the pavement. Most of the ground was a dull, dark gray color, but there was a section of the parking lot that looked like there had been some sort of oil spill or something. 
I just walked right past it and made my way around the back of the gas station in hopes that the restrooms were still unlocked. When I got to the restroom door, I couldn't help but notice more markings on the ground that looked like the same stain that was in front of the store. Once again, I ignored it though and began to open the restroom door. That was when it hit me. As soon as I opened the door, a scent came pouring out of the bathroom that sent me practically stumbling backward. Gagging from how horrible the stench was, I knew that I still needed to go, whether it was disgusting or not. So I took my bandana that I always kept in my back pocket and wrapped it around my face to try to help the smell. I took a deep breath before opening the door again and tried to be as quick as possible with getting in and out of the restroom. And as soon as I stepped inside, I realized what it was that I was smelling. Laying in the center of the bathroom floor was the body of a man who appeared to have been dead for quite some time. As soon as I saw the body and realized that the horrible stench was the smell of a decomposing corpse, I ran out of the bathroom as fast as I could and began throwing up. I quickly made my way back to my truck and began calling the police who came and examined the body. After giving them my statement, I was able to be on my way, which was good because I couldn't be late with my shipment. But as quick of an experience as that was, I will never forget that horrible smell. When I first got into truck driving as a career, my father used to tell me about these stories about guys that he knew that used to drive big rigs. According to him, a lot of them used to have firearms with them in their trucks to keep them safe while they were out on the road. Nowadays though, at least for the company that I work for, you're not allowed to carry weapons in your truck because if someone got hurt, it would end up being the company that got into trouble. That being said, I can understand why drivers feel like they need something to protect themselves. You never know what sort of situation you might find yourself in. I learned the hard way that you never know what to expect when it comes to being out on the road. It all went down when I was out delivering a shipment for a Kohl's distribution center that had me driving through Illinois. I found myself passing through the Chicago area, and by the time the traffic had dialed itself down a lot, it was probably around 9.30 at night when I found myself being rerouted by the truck's GPS. Apparently, a road had been closed up ahead, so I had to take a short detour. The GPS said that it was only supposed to tack on an extra 35 minutes to my trip, but along the way, things got really hairy. As I was making my way through the new route, I couldn't help but notice it was taking me through a residential neighborhood. Now, it was dark out so I couldn't quite tell, but from the looks of things, it was like I was driving through a ghost town. Hardly any of the homes that I slowly passed by appeared to have anyone living in them and many looked like they were in the process of being demolished. For a minute, it was like there was no life around me. That changed the second I turned a corner onto a different block. There were only a few people outside, but I could see a group of friends hanging out on the sidewalk in front of one of the houses. It was nothing too out of the ordinary, so I just continued to drive. However, I would learn that those kids that I saw hanging out were actually lookouts for some of the local gang members in the area. I only found this out when I ended up filing a police report about what happened next. As I continued driving, I started to notice what looked like taillights up ahead, which I assumed was just someone that had stopped at an intersection. However, as I approached the vehicle, I began to notice some things that made me feel a bit uneasy. I noticed that there were multiple men with their hoods up standing on either side of the street and to make matters worse. As soon as I passed one of the cars that had been parked on the side of the road, it started up and pulled out right behind me. I was blocked in. I brought the truck to a stop behind the car that was sitting at the intersection and within a matter of seconds, I had people at both of the doors of my truck, one of which was pointing a handgun of sorts through the driver's side window right at my head. I lifted my hands off the steering wheel as one of the men began to order me to get out of the truck. I didn't question him at all and began unbuckling my seatbelt and hopping out of the vehicle. As the man continued to point his gun at me, I saw another hop into the truck and get into the driver's seat. 
All the vehicles, including my truck, pulled away from the scene, and I was left there surrounded by five men, all grasping their firearms tightly. I thought I was done for. I couldn't even begin to figure out a way for me to make it out of this situation. But to my surprise, they took my wallet and cell phone and then sent me walking in the direction that I had come in. With every step away from them that I took, I was worried that I might hear the sound of gunshots. But thankfully, all I could hear was the sound of the men getting into the other cars that had been parked on the side of the road and then driving away. I made my way to the nearest police station and reported the incident. And honestly, the officers didn't look surprised. I guess carjackings are a normal thing in that area. All in all, they never found the merchandise that was taken. But thankfully, I managed not only to keep my life, but also my job. Do you remember that show, Ice Road Truckers? I used to love that show, especially as a driver myself. Now, I was never in a scenario where I had to drive my massive rig over a frozen lake or anything like that, but I will tell you right now that an icy road can be a death trap for anyone in a truck. It only takes one little slip and you can end your life or the life of somebody else. Driving in the winter is a truly terrifying thing in some states, and I will never forget the time that I almost lost my life on the road that I must have driven down almost a hundred times. It was back when I used to drive trucks for a local company, which meant that I was typically only ever driving from the distribution center to the stores in my area. And it was a great gig. I mean, it's one of the few times as a trucker that I actually got to spend almost every night with my family. It also meant that I was driving the same route over and over again. And after a while, they sort of became like second nature. That is until winter hit. This year was projected to be a particularly cold one, and almost every day there was warnings about black ice accumulating on the roadways. So I knew that now, more than any other time in the year, I had to be vigilant and pay attention to the street in front of me. That being said, you can do everything right and still end up slipping. On the day of my accident, everything started out just fine. I knew the roads had the potential to be bad, so I made sure to prepare myself and drive a bit slower than usual, especially when I made it onto one of the main roads in our area known as Crawford Street. Crawford was a very scenic mountain road that was absolutely beautiful to drive down under the right conditions. However, due to how windy the road was, I knew that it was going to be a problem for me that day. As soon as I made it onto Crawford, I could see the patches of ice lining the shoulders, and right away I began slowing down and driving very carefully. I must have made it about halfway down the road without an incident before I felt it. More than one of the tires on my passenger side must have touched the ice because I could feel them sliding. Out of nowhere, I felt the steering wheel begin to pull to the right as I continued going down the road. I tried to correct it. But that, coupled with more than one of my tires being unable to grip the road, my truck began to fishtail. I tried not to panic, but there was nothing I could do as I began barreling toward the guardrail on the side of the road, knowing full well that there was no way that I would be able to stop my truck from going off the side of the hill. As soon as my truck broke through the rail, I felt it pull to the side as the trailer hooked to the back began to roll down the hill, taking the cab and myself down with it. I had been buckled in, and the hill wasn't too large, so the truck only rolled about one and a half times. Thankfully, my only injury came from the shards of broken glass from all the windows shattering around me. It left me with a few lacerations, but when the truck finally came to a stop, I was able to unbuckle myself and crawl out of the cab before anything serious happened. I looked up to the section of the guardrail that I had torn through and was simply happy to be alive. I will never forget the feeling of being flipped around as the truck began rolling down the hill and driving through the wintry road will be forever something that puts me on edge. My husband and I got married on February 9th, 2010. And to save us the double whammy to our wallets, we picked a weekend around that time to have a joint Valentine slash anniversary celebration together. These celebrations usually involve a simple staycation style holiday, 
back when we were both on lower salary bands. But as the years went on and we got our finances in order, we started venturing further afield than just London or the home counties. Then, around Christmas of 2016, I was looking at potential Valentine's destinations when I suddenly found myself falling deep down the cottage core rabbit hole. Now back in the mid-2010s, it wasn't quite the same kind of cottagecore aesthetic that emerged on social media during the pandemic. Like a lot of inspiration came from Japanese mori fashion, which emphasizes muted colors and nude shades like beige, brown, off-white, light green, and earthy red, as well as natural materials like cotton, linen, wool, and leather. But anyway, after seeing a lot of posts outlining mori styles and aesthetics, I suddenly got a bee under my bonnet about staying in a remote country cottage over Valentine's weekend. When my husband agreed, we started looking at a few places and eventually settled on a small, cozy-looking cottage up in North Yorkshire. We booked the place from Friday the 12th to Sunday the 14th with plans to drive back home on the Monday morning and by early February, I was beginning to get really excited about the whole thing. Work had been hellish, the weather had been crap, and not one but two of our appliances were on the brink, so I really needed a little getaway by the time Valentine's Day loomed on the horizon. On the day itself, we got the earliest train possible up to York, then took a taxi out to the cottage. It turned out to be everything we could have possibly hoped for. A lot of Airbnb really try and do you over with the angles of pictures and all that, but all the fixtures and fittings were of the utmost quality. Me and my husband had a bath together in the giant tub that had been fitted upstairs, then after wandering into a nearby village, we got some pub food, had a couple of pints, then went back to the cottage to get some sleep. The next morning was just blissful. We had nothing planned, no work commitments to worry about. It was just me, him, and a weekend of coziness to look forward to. I made us some bacon and eggs, then after a long, steamy shower together... We sprawled ourselves on the living room settee and just relaxed. We had our phones switched off. Almost no one knew where we were and the cottage was basically smack bang in the middle of nowhere, which made it all the more surprising when at some point in the early afternoon, we heard a knock at the front door. It actually spooked us a little bit at first, hearing three piercing bangs out of absolutely nowhere. But regardless, we knew we had to answer it as it might have been the host trying to get some important info to us. After all, we've had our phones switched off all morning, so up we get, making sure to fasten our dressing gowns nice and tight so we don't give the visitor a surprise peep show, then we open up the door. Standing in front of us was a man around my dad's age, so mid-50s to early 60s, and behind him up the driveway is a large, plain white van. He gives us a warm and friendly greeting, then tells us that the owners have hired him and his building firm to do a bit of emergency renovation work. That meant that we'd have to vacate the property for around two to three hours. As you can imagine, me and my husband were very bewildered about the situation. The Airbnb host hadn't mentioned anything about any renovation work and there certainly didn't seem to be any sort of emergency inside. Everything looked fine. When we suggested that there must have been some kind of mistake... The bloke just shrugged like it wasn't his problem, told us a job's a job, then asked us what time we'd be okay vacating for a couple of hours. My husband rarely gets annoyed at things like that. He's a very patient person, but the idea of paying almost a grand to then have our holiday interrupted, I could tell that he was fuming about it. Fuming though he was, my husband asked the builder if he didn't mind waiting a few minutes because he wanted to give the host a call to clear a few things up. Suddenly... The builder's attitude changes completely, and instead of being all polite, he just said, Oi, in this really aggressive way, stopping my husband in his tracks as he was closing the front door. Then I swear to God, he says, I tried the easy way. Don't make me do things the hard way. Both me and my husband are like, You what? Both pretty offended as how rude he was being. Then as he starts prattling on about us leaving the cottage, my husband shouts something about calling the police before slamming the door in his face. We didn't call the police, not right away anyway. Instead, I grabbed my phone and got onto the host to see if the man's claims were genuine. It took a while to get them to call us back, but when they did, 
they denied having arranged any kind of building work. We then tried to clarify who the man was and why he'd been so threatening, but the host claimed to have no idea. They asked us to call the police if we didn't feel safe, and if we really didn't want to stay another night, we could leave with a full refund if we'd considered booking another time. The host and his wife were those two pensioners who supplemented their income through the rentals, and they were so sweet about the whole thing. So instead of us turning tail and running at the first sign of trouble, we decided to stay for the duration of our booking and enjoy the holiday we'd worked so hard to afford. Whatever the weird bloke's game was, we were pretty confident that the threat of calling the police would dissuade him from whatever he had in mind. And if it didn't, well, we'd just cross that bridge when we came to it. If we'd have known what was about to happen, if the bloke had given us any clue whatsoever, we'd have been out of there within the hour. But he didn't. When he turned nasty, it was all these cryptic antagonistic warnings and threats that were only ever going to provoke a defensive response. We had no idea what he had in mind, so we stayed, and a couple of hours later, it all started to go downhill. It's early evening, so about 6 o'clock, and because of the time of year, it's almost completely dark outside. Obviously, we were still quite concerned by the strange bloke's bizarre visit, but after my husband found an old cricket bat in his upstairs cupboard, we felt marginally safer. On top of that, hours had gone by and we'd seen hide nor hair of our unwelcome visitor, so we just crossed our fingers that we'd see no more of him and got on with our romantic weekend getaway. We weren't feeling particularly hungry and the pub served food until 8 so we decided on a quick dip in the giant bath before beginning the walk into the village. The upstairs layout was such that the bathroom was on the front side of the cottage, with the bedroom at the rear. The bedroom had this cute pair of wooden framed windows that opened outward into the back garden, but the bathroom had only one small circular window that opened just a crack. If you looked out, you could see the cottage's driveway, along with a little bit of the lane outside, so when we were in the bath and we thought that we heard a noise coming from outside, my husband climbed out of the tub and peered through the glass onto the driveway. Like I might have already mentioned, my husband is the most emotive person, definitely the counterweight to me being very fiery, but that's another story. You hardly ever see him angry, and you never see him scared. So when he turned around to me, and I saw this look of blind terror on his face, I knew that we were in a hell of a lot of trouble. Get out of the bathroom, put some clothes on, was all he said after that, and he ran to the bedroom to do so himself. You can imagine how panicked I am, because he still hadn't told me what he'd seen that had got him so frightened. It was the bloody zombie apocalypse for all I knew, so while I too rushed to put some clothes on, I'm asking him over and over again what's going on. Please just tell me what's happening. There are people outside. They've got masks on. We need to hide. I knew it was connected to the guy who'd visit us in the early afternoon. I just bloody knew it. I just hadn't the foggiest idea how. I made sure to throw on as many layers as I could, knowing that we'd probably end up running out the back door or something if the blokes outside tried coming through the front. Then bang. What turned out to be a sledgehammer smashed into the front door, and we take that as our cue to get the hell out of there. We ran downstairs actually saw the damage that was done to the door by whoever was breaking it down, then bolted towards the kitchen, which is where the back doors were. It was very scary, but I remember knowing that whatever the man or men wanted, it involved the cottage, not us. If we just ran off and stayed away for a few hours, everything would be fine, right? Wrong. My husband swung open the back doors after struggling to unlock them, but instead of being greeted by the path to freedom, we were greeted by a man in a balaclava with a massive crowbar-looking thing in his hands. We were trapped. The man with the crowbar thing ordered us back into the house, and he was soon joined by another masked man carrying what looked an awful lot like a big saw. One of them told my husband, If you do anything stupid, we'll kill your missus. And that kept him fairly quiet. Me, on the other hand, I was just so scared so I kept saying all sorts of things begging them not to hurt us, that we were sorry, that we'd just leave if they let us go free. 
All they replied with was, shut up, shut your mouth. And then the next thing I know, we're being led into one of the upstairs rooms and made to kneel. I was so scared that they were going to kill us. All that assurance that they were there to rob the house or something just completely went out the window. And in the end, I had to make so much noise that they shoved a pillowcase in my mouth to keep me quiet. The next thing I remember, the intruders made my husband tell them where our phones were. And that gave me more hope that they weren't going to hurt us. They didn't seem like petty thieves, so taking our phones was to ensure us that we wouldn't be able to phone the police once they left, I was thinking. I only really started to calm down and compose myself when I heard some really loud banging from downstairs. And my husband started reminding me that they weren't there for us, that they were just looking for something, and if all the hammering was anything to go by, it was something in the walls. Since we were told to keep completely quiet, we could hear all the smashing and bashing downstairs and we could hear the guys saying things to each other. You could hear, try this one here and then bang. Someone would smash a sledgehammer into a wall. Then you'd hear others ripping the wood and plaster apart, no doubt looking for something. They did this over and over again until finally, you heard someone downstairs shout, got it. I couldn't see what was going on, but you could tell that they'd found what they were looking for because there was this big flurry of activity before the guy guarding us suddenly leaned in and growled something to us. I don't want to hear an effing peep out of the two of you until we're gone. You try anything, and we'll kill both of you. After that, he was gone, and after a little bit more activity from downstairs, the cottage was silent again. Neither of us moved for what felt like a very long time. Even though it felt like we were in the clear, I couldn't stop shaking. In fact, I think I was shaking harder then than I was when they were tying our hands, blindfolding and gagging us. And that was just all raw fear. What came next was this emotionally exhaustive adrenaline come down. When we finally thought it was safe, my husband somehow wriggled his way out of his bindings then untied mine as he tried to reassure me. I just burst into tears as he hugged me, having never felt so grateful to be alive in my whole life. It felt like we'd lived through a nightmare come to life. It was surreal in the extreme, and once we collected ourselves, we began to creep downstairs to survey the damage. The cottage was completely empty apart from us, but we crept downstairs nonetheless, taking in a stare at a time in total silence, terrified that a masked man would suddenly reappear in what remained of the front door frame. Thankfully, no one came back, and as we edged our way into the front room, our jaws dropped to the extent of the damage. They'd taken a sledgehammer, along with a saw and God knows what else, and they'd torn up all the walls in both the front and back rooms of the cottage. It was a total mess, but through all the torn up wallpapers and layers of settled plaster dust, a sort of pattern started to emerge. Most sections of wall bore a few sledgehammer strikes, but only one section was completely torn out. Just like we'd heard them, they'd been probing sections of the wall before they found whatever they were looking for, then they'd torn out that whole section to retrieve it. We had a good look inside the hole they'd made, but there was no trace of whatever had been hidden there. They'd also smashed the landline phone, so there was no contacting anyone without walking into the nearby village to get some help. So that's what we did. We set up camp in the corner of the local pub, and after hearing what happened to us, the locals were basically lining up to buy us pints and offer their condolences. This was great for me, as I definitely needed something to calm my nerves, but not so much for my husband, who was our designated driver back to London a few hours later. We had some dinner, they made calls to the police, the Airbnb host, and our loved ones back home, each explaining the situation and what we planned on doing next. After that, we waited around the pub to give a statement to one of the local coppers whose colleagues had driven over to the cottage to cordon off their crime scene. We told him what we knew, swapped contact details, then got started on the drive back to London. We were still very shaken up and if they hadn't bashed the door down in bloody February, we'd have probably just stayed the final night. So all we were interested in when we got home were hot showers and early nights. But then the following morning, 
the theory started. Over breakfast, we started to talk about how bad we felt for the owner. Granted, what we went through was extremely grim, but we weren't hurt and they'd stolen nothing but our phones, which were both insured, thankfully. On the other hand, our sweet retiree hosts had their pension investments smashed up, all after sinking thousands into renovating it. But then, what had the masked men taken, and who did it belong to? It was obviously so important and possibly so illegal that they felt the need to tie us up, blindfold us, and deny us any means of contacting the police so they were safe to retrieve it. But after that, all we had was unanswered questions and increasingly wild ones at that. I'd like to tell you that we found out, or even that we came up with some kind of solid theory, but the God's honest truth is that we're flummoxed, and apparently so are the police. To our knowledge, the owners hadn't reported anything stolen, and even with the security camera footage which showed the group of men arriving, they just didn't have enough to go on to make any arrests. The rest of the story is a bit boring and involves refunds, insurance claims, and a lot of retelling the whole event to friends and relatives. It was horrible, but like I've said, neither of us are particularly traumatized and we both firmly put it all behind us. But sometimes, just sometimes, I'd give my left arm to know what had been hidden in that bloody wall. My name is Emily and this took place back in 2014 when I was a sophomore at my new high school. For reference, I'm a female and I was 16 years old at the time of this story. I had just moved to the school from my hometown in Savannah due to a job change from my dad where he could make a better income. Because I was a new student at the school, I was definitely no popular kid. I was in the honors program and was your typical nerd wandering around who only focused on her studies and had trouble interacting with new people. That one girl who you'd think has no life and no friends only to end up being the most brightest student in school. Even though I had zero friends at the time, there was still this one guy in two of my classes who seemed really nice. His name was Jake, and he was a pretty cool guy for the most part. He'd ask me about what I was studying, if I liked the school, and so on and so forth. After a while, I started to consider Jake as a real friend and was glad to finally meet someone. On Valentine's Day, I was sitting down at a table at school, eating my lunch when Jake walks up to me and straight up asks me if I wanted to be his valentine. The thing was, was that he had brought me a bouquet of roses and a bunch of chocolate, which I found odd. I was speechless at first and really wasn't expecting him to do that. Jake and I only met not even a month ago and I didn't really see him other than a friend. I politely turn him down and he begins to give me a look full of disappointment and he then gets up to leave. I felt bad, obviously, but I really wasn't looking for a relationship at the time as I had other stuff to worry about. That night, I was finishing up my project that was due for my chemistry class when I heard my Skype start ringing. I take a look at my computer and see that an unknown number is calling me. After all, I have been begging one of my cousins to try it out so we could chat through there. When I answered the call, I heard the all too familiar voice of Jake on the other end of the line. I immediately hang up and turn off my laptop for the rest of the night, not wanting to talk with Jake anymore. I have no idea as to how he managed to get my Skype, not to mention my phone number. I didn't sleep well for the rest of the night and I was afraid of going to school the next day fearing Jake and what he'd possibly say to me. For whatever reason, I finally decided to go and was surprised to find that Jake had not been in either one of my classes. It was strange, but I was honestly relieved. 
During one of my classes, we were all going over our tests when my teacher gets a phone call and tells me to go to the office for something. The sophomores at the school were still a bit immature and I was bombarded with oohs and laughs while walking out. I get to the main office and go into the conference room and was greeted to three police officers as well as my principal and another student that I have never seen before sobbing. They tell me to have a seat and get straight to the point and begin to ask me about Jake. My face went pale and I was honest with them and told them that he had been stalking me for a few days now. They went on to explain that Jake was planning on killing me and another student on that specific day because we had both rejected him to be his valentine. They didn't say how he was planning on doing this, but they were eventually told by another student that he was planning on something and my name was mentioned. I was petrified and couldn't even move due to the sheer panic I was feeling inside of me. The whole school had issued an email and a phone call to all the staff and parents addressing that there was a threat and that the school would be on high alert. They had refused to give me any more information about how they found this out or as to why he didn't show up for school. My parents pulled me out of school for a week until Jake was taken care of and that there wouldn't be a threat to me anymore. It turns out, Jake was known to have told threats against people, especially females who have turned him down or did him wrong in some way. There hasn't been any clear evidence that he's ever done something like that in the past, but just because he's never done it before, it doesn't mean that he'll never do it. I never saw Jake again after that incident, and he thankfully never returned to school. I still don't know if he was expelled, locked in prison, or perhaps something even worse. This incident will forever be with me for the rest of my life, knowing that someone had the sheer desire to end my life, all because of a rejection. This started when I was in middle school. I was 12 at the time, so having a valentine was everything to me. I was a social kid, and I liked this boy. We'll call him Kenneth, and honestly, I thought he liked me back. Every day of that February after lunch, there were little notes that someone put in my locker. I thought it was weird because his locker was far from mine, but I was a daydreamer. I just thought that he liked me back, that he liked me enough that he would leave notes for me. The day before Valentine's, a kid that was very skinny and was wearing a black hood with a Lions logo stood in front of my locker, blocking me from it. Hi, he said shivering. Would you like to go on a date? I had never seen this guy before. I was trying to see how awkward it would be if we were on a date and we didn't know what to talk about. Sorry, I have plans, I said, and I walked away. It was really weird. Later, I was walking home and I stopped to get something from Target. I was looking at some candy bars when I noticed someone that was as tall as me. He had this hood with a lion's logo on it. I left with the candy bar and I started to make my way home. I called my mom to tell her that I was going to be late. There was a shortcut that was an abandoned train station. I would only take it when I was going to be late. As I was walking, a bush next to me started to move. And I don't know why, but after what I saw at the store, I freaked out and I ran the rest of the way home. When I finally got home, I got out my phone and I saw a text. It was from an unknown number. There were pictures of me running and me walking around the store. I immediately showed them to my mom and she simply said it was probably friends. Friends or not, that's simply creepy. The next day I showed my friends the number. They looked at the number and said, that's, that's the weird kid's number. I know because he gave it to me and I never texted him. This really freaked me out. I still see him around the school, but when I do, I'll glare at him and I try to keep my distance. And number six, the break-in, submitted by Ralph. For this story, I will need to tell you a bit of background information. I am six feet tall, 16 years old, and I live in a very small country named Latvia. Probably some of you know it. 
I have shared this story only with close friends, other family members, and my parents. We live in a two-story house, and my room is on the second floor. My parents often leave me home alone because they travel a lot for work things. This happened on Valentine's Day 2015. It was a cold winter night, and I had just broken up with my girlfriend, so I was completely alone to watch the house. It was around eight that night. I was downstairs watching TV shows on Netflix when I heard a light knocking on my living room door. I got up to look outside, and there was no one there. After an hour or so, I heard the tapping again. I peeked outside, only to see someone running by the bush where the road leads to another street. I thought someone was pranking me, so I didn't really care too much. After a half hour of watching TV shows, I got bored, so I asked my friend to come over. He lived about five minutes away from where I live. For safety purposes, I'll call him Jake. Jake was shorter than me and a year younger. He came over and we played some video games. After a while, I needed to go pee, so I went upstairs to use the bathroom. When I got back to the living room, Jake told me he heard tapping on the window. I wasn't surprised, and I told him before he got here, I heard the tapping too. One hour passed, and then we heard the tapping coming again, and we ignored it. After about three minutes, we heard footsteps upstairs, and that's when things got serious. We muted the game. The footsteps stopped. We thought the footsteps were in the game, so we continued to play, trying to listen at the same time. Then we heard something heavy fall upstairs in my parents' bedroom. I paused the game and me and Jake went upstairs. We checked every room. We checked my parents last. I peeked inside the room and saw nothing. It was pitch black. And I turned on the light and went into the room with Jake behind me. Jake checked the closet and I checked everywhere else. As we were leaving the room, I forgot that we did not check under the bed. So I hesitantly asked Jake if he could just quickly look. He walked over slowly, obviously a bit anxious. He looked under the bed, and he jumped up faster than I've ever seen him get up. He bolted out of the room without saying a word, and I quickly turned off the light and slammed the door shut. Jake was already downstairs. I rushed down there to him, and he was pale as snow. I asked him what was wrong, and his answer made my heart sink. He said there was someone under the bed, smiling with eyes wide open. We rushed outside and called the police. We hid behind a bush that was in front of my home. As I was on the line with the police officer, Jake and I saw my parents' bedroom light come on. I asked them to come over as fast as they possibly could. We watched the house for about 10 minutes, but we saw no movement inside. When police finally arrived, two officers went to search the house, and the third officer asked a couple of questions. After a moment, the two police officers came out of the house with a middle-aged man. He had a long beard with wide, bloodshot eyes. His face was full of scars and bruises. Now I get why Jake looked so pale. One of the police officers told us that the man had a knife hidden in one of his pockets. He had broken in by an unlocked bedroom window, but how on earth did he get up to the second floor? I have no idea. The police called my family, who said they'd be back in town as soon as they possibly could. Nothing like that has happened since that day, but I still get goosebumps thinking about and writing this because it sounds like even if I didn't invite Jake over, I still wouldn't have spent Valentine's Day alone. My name is Jen. I'm in my 40s and me and my friend run a business via Airbnb here in the UK. We own a few different properties across London and while my friend acts as the financial backing, I run the day-to-day -day business of dealing with repairs and quest queries, as well as inspecting the rentals both before the guests arrive and after they check out. As you can imagine, summertime is our busiest period of the year, with business picking up a lot around Christmas too. But then we always have this really quiet period around the autumn where we struggle to break even, and it really puts a dent in our annual profits. So imagine our joy when last year, we got a three week long booking for one of our swankier properties in North London. It was a huge payday for us, even with the block discount that Airbnb mandates and we tried to be as welcoming and accommodating as possible to increase the chance of repeat business. For those of you that have used Airbnb before, you'll know that the vast majority of rentals are completely non-contact, and that style of rental only increased over the course of the pandemic. That means that 
we didn't meet our renters even once and throughout the whole of their three-week stay, we didn't receive a single call from them. The only thing we knew is that one of the two guests was a girl named Alice. Alice paid the deposit, the rental fee, everything. So about halfway through the stay, I dropped Alice a text to ask if everything was going okay. The reply said nothing other than, like, fine, thanks, so we assumed their stay was going wonderfully. I certainly wasn't complaining that they were low-maintenance guests because as much as I don't mind helping out where and when I'm needed, there's nothing worse than a guest who keeps calling you up every five minutes, asking where things are, claiming that things are broken when they're not. When their three weeks were over, I made my way over to the flat to make sure everything was in order. I wasn't expecting anything to be rough, maybe a few towels left on the floor, maybe a full bin bag, the usual stuff that people leave behind when they're in a hurry to leave. We'd had someone really make a mess of one of the flats before after having an all-night party there, so I was always ready to be greeted by an absolute horror show. But nothing could have prepared me for what I found in that flat that day. I knew something was wrong almost immediately after trying to get into the flat, as there seemed to be something blocking the door from the other side. It took me a good few shoves to get in, then I saw that someone had piled some chairs up against the door as a means of slowing down entry, but not completely barring access. I also noticed how cold it was, which was the first hint that I got that someone had left one of the windows open, something we specifically asked guests not to do since the area had something of a pigeon problem. I rather quickly deduced that whoever had tried to bar the door had done so, then used a window to actually leave the flat. By why ever in God's name they'd want to do that was a complete mystery to me, at least for the next few minutes anyway. I walked into the living room to shut the window and I could tell that it was the living room because of the cold breeze coming from it, and that's when I saw the mess they'd made. But unlike the mess the partiers leave behind, which tended to be loads of empty bottles and cans, cigarette butts, that sort of thing, the place looked like there had been some kind of fight. Loads of glasses and plates were smashed. The chairs were gone. The tables were overturned. It was a complete mess. The next place I checked was the bedroom, deciding to leave the bathroom till last because I was honestly dreading whatever had been left in there, and seeing the state the bedroom had been left in just made me dread it even more. There were all kinds of empty condom wrappers all over the bedroom, as well as all kinds of adult toys strewn around the room. The sheets had stains on them, and God knows what they'd come from, but the whole room just reeked of you-know-what. It was disgusting. Finally, I braced myself to check the bathroom to see what kind of mess had been left behind, expecting something god-awful that I'd probably have to spend the rest of the morning cleaning. But then, like I said, I could never have been ready for what was behind that door. I pushed open the bathroom door, took a peek inside, then immediately slammed it closed after seeing something lying in the bath. Something person-shaped. I say person-shaped because just from the split second I saw it, it didn't actually look like a person, not a living one anyway. It was all lumpy and covered in gore, almost like it was just pieces of fresh meat butchered and piled on top of one another. I think I was just in denial about what I saw at first. I mean, I didn't want it to be what it was. And so in those few moments, I tried to think of everything it could have been instead of what it actually was. I don't know what actually drove me to open the door again. I certainly didn't want to, if that makes any sense. I think I'd actually managed to convince myself that what I'd seen wasn't real, that I'd just assumed the worst after seeing the rest of the flat and that it just wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Only, it was as bad as I thought it was. If anything, it was worse. It was a body, and it was just lying there in the bath in probably the worst condition you can possibly imagine. Partly the reason why I didn't recognize it as one immediately is because the girl's face was so beaten up that she didn't even look human anymore. And there wasn't a single patch of skin that didn't have blood drying on it. But it wasn't that brown-looking blood that had clawed it. It actually still looked kind of fresh, like it had only been there for a few hours at the most. 
I immediately pulled my phone out, dialing 999 to tell them that I needed the police as quickly as they could get there. The girl, who I assume was the girl who'd rented from us, was just laying there, perfectly still, and I couldn't hear her breathing or anything, so I just assumed that she was dead. I even told the bloke on the other end of the line that I was almost certain she was dead, and that's when he asked me to check her pulse to make sure. I did as he asked, 100% certain that I wouldn't feel a thing because in my mind, no one on earth could survive the kind of violence that she'd been put through. I don't even think I was touching the right spot on her neck at first, because again, I couldn't feel a thing, and after racking my brain for a minute, trying to remember the girl's name, I think I just blanked because of the panic. I just said, Alice? And then, she opened her eyes. Having that happen, like she'd properly come back from the dead or something, was the single most terrifying moment of my life. It was absolutely horrendous. They were all bloodshot too, and one of them had absolutely no white in the eye whatsoever. It was just a bright red mess of broken blood vessels. Then, as soon as she laid eyes on me, she started screaming and lashing out, terrifying me so much as I just ran out of the flat and into the corridor outside while shouting that she's alive, she's alive, down the phone. I remember the guy on the other end of the phone telling me to go and unlock the front door to the flat building, since it was an old style place with a door you could leave on the latch. After that, I had to run back upstairs to make sure the girl didn't let herself out of the flat, as she had obviously just launched into fight or flight mode after waking up and thinking that she was still in danger. When I got upstairs, the girl was half naked, just slouched in the hallway outside the flat, and she was crying her eyes out. I told her to stay put, and that the ambulance was on the way. Then all she did was cry those choked sobs while her tears cleared the blood from her face. And that's another image I'll never get out of my head. How her tears actually seemed to clean the blood from the parts of her deformed face they'd touched. When the paramedics arrived, I found out that the only reason she hadn't actually run off after waking up screaming was because she literally couldn't. I don't know what kind of damage had been done to her legs, but the paramedics had to bring in a stretcher up to the hallway to actually get her down into the ambulance. After she was taken to the hospital, a second set of policemen, the first went with her to the hospital, asked me to stay out of the flat on behalf of a forensics team which were on their way down. Then they proceeded to ask me a load of questions regarding exactly what I'd seen and what I knew about the people renting. Obviously, I knew next to nothing other than her name and the amount of time that she'd been staying for, but I answered their questions as best they could. They also promised to keep me in the loop regarding certain details of the investigation so I could pass on the details to our insurance company for the eventual claim we were going to file with them. About a week or so later, I got a call from an officer, and while he didn't tell me exactly what had happened, he told me everything he was permitted to tell me. Basically, the two girls who rented the flat were call girls, who'd come down from the north to use the place as a kind of base of operations for three weeks, because they could basically charge more for their services in London than they could up north. At least, that was their logic. Apparently, their little idea had worked really well, and they'd had a profitable, relatively trouble-free few weeks. But then, on the night before they'd been due to check out, some local gangsters had gotten wind of their little operation and didn't take kindly to them operating in their area. Apparently, these girls were charging quite a bit of money, but it was still lower than the rate that these gangsters had agreed upon for all their girls. So, they hatched a little plan. They would raid the flat the girls were staying in, scare them enough that they'd leave the area, and take any money they'd made in the process. But the thing was, the girls didn't keep much money in the flat with them, and were taking the cash to a friend of theirs who just so happened to live in London too. That's how only one girl ended up getting left in the bath. She ended up being the only one they beat the crap out of and torturing as a means of scaring the other girl, who they forced out of the window before making her lead them to where they'd stashed all their money. And that was all I was told. And as much as the officer hinted that they got a few blokes in custody, he obviously couldn't tell me who they were or who they were affiliated with. And that's all the info I got too, 
as the police didn't get back in touch aside to tell us that we were free to use the apartment again, and I was more focused on the insurance claim than anything else after that. That was the single worst incident in the history of our little Airbnb business, and probably one of the worst things I'd ever come across in my entire life. Okay, so a few years back, me and my girlfriend decided to get out of the city for a few days by renting an Airbnb. We spent a while looking at a bunch of different places, then finally settled in this place on a farm about two hours drive outside of the city. It was this little guest house on a farm, just across from the main house where the owners must have lived. We talked a little via email after actually paying for the place. Just little things like if we wanted some wine or some coffee left for our arrival. They were really friendly like that. Then just a few days before we were due to drive out there, they suddenly stopped replying to our emails. It was a little worrying, but not hugely so. I mean, we paid our fees and stuff, so we were definitely entitled to rent the little guest house for the week that we paid for. Besides, we figured that they were just busy or something and would get back to us as soon as they could. They told us in one email that the keys to the place would be in a lockbox that was attached to the place's porch, and that they'd email us the code on either the day before we arrived or the day of our arrival for security reasons. But then, like I said, they seemed to just go totally dark just a few days before, and they ended up not emailing us any kind of code. We were kind of annoyed, as anyone might be, and as we'd already paid our money and all that. I know we probably should have just cancelled the trip and got a refund from Airbnb, but we really liked the idea of staying out on this farm place as it would make the perfect little break from our busy urban lives. So we decided to just roll the dice, drive out there, and get the code to the lockbox by knocking at the actual farmhouse instead of relying on email and stuff. The place was relatively easy to find, and both the farmhouse and the little guest house looked awesome. There was just one problem. The door to the main house was wide open, and there was a trail of clothes and household items leading up to a spot that looked like a truck or car had once sat. As you can guess, we could instantly tell that something wasn't right, as it looked like whoever had lived there had left in a hurry for some reason. Just to be sure, we walked up to the door, knocked on it, even thought it was open and called out, Hello? And stuff like that. We didn't get any reply, so there was definitely no one home and we didn't actually have any of their numbers so there was no getting in touch with them to find out where they'd gone or when they'd be back. Not that we actually thought that they were coming back anytime soon, the trail of stuff gave us a pretty good idea that no one would want to be returning at all. The only real questions we were faced with was, why the hell did the family leave in such a hurry and what exactly scared them so bad that They'd want to leave so fast. We didn't exactly stick around for very long. The bad vibes were seriously heavy in the air, and my girlfriend was begging me to get us out of there from almost the moment we got out of the car. But in the time we were there, we didn't see any blood or anything like that. No bullet holes either. Nothing to indicate what had happened to make people want to run away. We made sure to call the cops on the way back into the city just to let them know that something had happened if they didn't know already. Getting our money back from Airbnb was actually much easier than we figured too. I guess they couldn't get in touch with the family either, and since it was still the day that we were due to check in, the money was still in digital limbo or whatever system they used to get us the money pretty quickly. I always wondered about what happened to the family though. We didn't end up getting any real answers about it, other than the fact that we got our money back pretty quickly, which I'm guessing meant that they didn't contest the refund with Airbnb. We've rented Airbnb since then too, with none of that same creepiness being repeated. So while I definitely recommend using the company, I suppose you just don't know what you're walking into until you're actually there. When I turned 26, my friends and I decided to rent a small lakeside cabin that we found on Airbnb to have some fun on the lake for my birthday. It was a really cool idea, and I'll never forget my friends for being kind enough to do that for me. I mean, it wasn't the best birthday I ever had, but they couldn't have accounted 
for what was going to happen. You see, we got to the cabin on Thursday at around 4 p.m., so there was still enough time to swim for a bit before it got dark. As soon as we realized that, we all just ran inside, tossed our stuff on the beds, and then got ready to hit the lake. We swam for about an hour before deciding to call it a night and relax with some food and a fire. I brought my guitar, and we all had a good time before we ended up getting tired. But eventually, it was time to put out the fire and go to bed. We all went inside and hung out for another couple of minutes before splitting into the two rooms and hitting the hay. The bed wasn't too comfortable, but after swimming and eating way too much junk, I ended up passing out without any problems. Now normally, I'm a really heavy sleeper. The only thing that wakes me up is when something makes me move or touches my face. And I remember being woken up by the feeling of something tickling my nose, which caused me to swap whatever it was away and roll over to my side, which was when I heard a strange, whispering sort of noise. I couldn't tell what it was, but I was far too tired. So assuming it was just my buddies messing with me, I said cut it out, I'm trying to sleep. That was when I heard the noise again. So this time I sat up and turned to yell at the guys who I thought were messing with me. But to my surprise, no one was there. And Kyle, my friend who I was sharing the room with, he was still knocked out. I shook my head and figured that I must have felt a fly or something land on my face before deciding to lie back down. As I closed my eyes, I could tell that I was going to be asleep in no time. But before I could get there, the noise was back. I couldn't make it out, but I swear it was like a whisper or someone snickering. Only this time, the sound was coming from the foot of my bed. I wasn't messing around anymore, and this time I sprang from my bed ready to confront whoever was messing with me. But again, there was nothing there. But as I looked back toward the bed, I realized what I had been hearing. It wasn't whispering at all. Instead, it was the quiet hissing of a snake that had somehow made its way into my bed. I freaked out and woke up Kyle who responded the same. We woke up the other two guys who were with us to check the whole cabin to see if there were any other animal intruders as we also figured out how to remove the snake from my bed. None of us could tell if it was venomous or not, but eventually, we figured out how to get it into a pillowcase and brought it out of the woods before letting it go. I didn't get any sleep the entire three days that we were at the cabin. There was no way, not after a snake woke me up by touching my face, it's definitely a birthday I'll never forget. In the summer of 2014, my wife Joanne, who at the time was just my fiance, and I went on a cross-country trip for the summer with the hopes of hitting all of the biggest sights along the way. From the Grand Canyon to see the giant redwoods in Grizzly State Park where they shot the forest moon of Endor scenes from Star Wars. It was a really great trip, despite a few hiccups, and we learned a lot of really good lessons along the way. The biggest of which might have been to stick with hotels because Airbnbs cannot be trusted. We were passing through Montana, and on Airbnb, we found a nice looking house to stay in that wasn't too expensive and didn't seem to have any neighbors aside from the owner of the house who lived on his own home right next door. When we got there, the house looked really nice. The interior was really simple, and it only had one bedroom, a living room, a bathroom, and a kitchen, so it wasn't too big. It was perfect for just the two of us, especially since we only planned on staying for one night. After getting settled in, my fiance and I decided to get ourselves cleaned up and as a way to save some water, we both decided to hop in the shower together. Now, before getting in, both of us put our bags on the bed in the bedroom, but if I remember right, neither of us had removed any of our belongings, aside from the clothes that we were going to change into. Then we both went into the bathroom at the same time and didn't get out until we were finished getting cleaned up. 
But when we got out of the bathroom and went into the bedroom, I noticed that there were more of the clothes on the bed than we left out. That means that someone was going through our stuff while we were in the bathroom. I tried to shake the thought out of my head and told myself that Joanne must have just been looking for something and I just wasn't remembering right. After getting dressed, the two of us were feeling hungry and decided to go out for some dinner at a local diner which ended up being really pleasant. That would be the last nice feeling that we would have that night. After returning to the house that we had rented for the night, Joanne made her way up to the door and then inside as I grabbed the leftovers from the car and locked it up. But before I could finish locking the door, I heard her let out a loud scream. I ran into the house as fast as I could and saw Joanne pointing toward the bedroom. I asked her what happened and she said that when she walked into the house, she heard something slam closed in the bedroom. Making my way over to the bedroom door, I very cautiously stuck my head in but I didn't see anything. I looked over to the closet. The door was still open as we left it, and there was no one in the room as far as I could see. I walked over to the bed and checked underneath, but there was nothing. I tried to convince Joanne that the pressure change from the door opening and closing probably shut one of the cabinets in the kitchen or something, and eventually, we were able to calm ourselves down and get some sleep. I wish I had listened to her more, though. Later that night, I woke up to use the bathroom, and as I was making my way back into the bed, I heard what sounded to me like heavy breathing. I looked over to Joanne, but it wasn't coming from that direction. It sounded like it was coming from the wall. I slowly made my way over to the wall, near the nightstand beside our bed, and as I went to place my ear against it, I could hear the sound of something scampering away followed by the sound of something closing shut. I ran over to the window to look outside, and I saw someone running across the yard toward the owner's house. I woke Joanne up, and we called the cops. We turned on the lights, and we made sure all of the windows and doors were locked. After taking a closer look at the wall, I noticed a small seam that ran down the wall and was hidden right behind the nightstand. And after the police arrived, they checked it out and found a small cubby-like room that led to a small hatch on the back of the house. The police went up to the owner's house to question him about it, but they apparently couldn't find him, and according to them, even if the owner was hiding in the wall, it was his property, so it technically wasn't illegal. Joanne and I decided to book a room at the nearby hotel that had a vacancy, and moved our stuff over there before deciding to never use Airbnb again. Sometimes the creepiest people live less than an hour away from you, and you wouldn't even know it unless you happen to interact with them. I learned this lesson when my house became infested with bedbugs after my cousin visited and we had to get it fumigated. This meant that we all had to stay away from the house for three full days before it was safe for us to go back inside. So to make the best of a bad situation, my mom and dad decided to rent a nice looking Airbnb that was just outside the city. It was supposed to be really exciting because I had never left the confines of New York City until then. So as a 13 year old, I was pretty hyped, but things didn't exactly turn out as great as I hoped. When we pulled up to the house, it all looked great. They had a fenced in yard and a long driveway with a basketball hoop and a ball for us to play with. And there was even a big motion sensor light in case we wanted to play outside after dark. My parents and I rushed into the house and began checking it out before ultimately getting settled in. Once we got comfortable, we ate some dinner and decided to go for a short walk afterwards to check out the area before it got too dark. The little neighborhood that the house was in looked nice. There was a few houses on the street and they all looked similar. The trees that lined the road were really nice and the fact that I could actually hear some insects was astounding to me compared to the rush of the city. But on our way back to the house, things got a little odd when we noticed that someone was standing at the end of their driveway, just staring at the house. As we got closer, my dad said hello and introduced himself by letting the man know that we were staying there for a few days, but the man didn't respond. Instead, he just looked at my dad 
and then at my mom and me before turning around and walking down the street away from us. It was one of the weirdest things I had experienced up until that point in my life. The three of us made our way into the house quickly and double locked the door behind us before sitting down and finding a movie to watch. And after a while, it was time to go to bed and we were all feeling a bit weird after we saw that man. So instead of sleeping in separate rooms as we planned, we all decided to fall asleep in the living room. The three of us ended up falling asleep for a while before I was woken up by a sudden flash of light coming through the window. I looked toward it from the couch and I could tell that it was the motion sensor light in the driveway and it might have just turned on. So I got up to see what it was, thinking it might have been a dog or something. But I was wrong and the scream that I let out woke up both my parents. They looked at me and then toward the window where they saw the same man from before just standing at the end of the driveway staring toward the house. My mom got out her phone to call the owner of the Airbnb as my dad ran to the front door and began screaming at the man. As soon as he saw my dad, he took off running and when my mom got off the phone with the person we were renting the house from, we all decided to find different sleeping arrangements because according to the owner, that was just the neighbor. She said he's always been obsessed with the house and stopped by multiple times a day and night just to look at it for some reason. That didn't sit right with us and we ended up just staying at a motel until our place was finished being fumigated. This story happened just last month. My wife and I were planning to take a little vacation just for the weekend. We found an Airbnb up in a really nice area with a lot of great land. The place was way up north, about four hours away. It was a house, sort of like a cabin, and was up on a hill with a really nice deck overlooking the massive amount of land nearby. The area was mostly woods, hills, and just land. We also really liked it because of how secluded it was from the rest of the houses there weren't really any other buildings or houses in sight. In fact, most areas over there were just vacation homes or cabins. We drove up there early Friday morning and arrived to the property at about 10 a.m. When we got there, we had a great time just relaxing and enjoying the area. It didn't take long though before our trip took a turn for the worst. That night, as we were just sitting in the living room of the house watching a movie, all of a sudden we heard a knocking sound. I couldn't tell where it was coming from at first, but after pausing the movie and getting up, I could tell it was coming from one of the windows. I walked down a hallway to where the noise was coming from. As I got closer, I was able to locate the window, and then the knocking stopped. I reached the window where it was coming from, but I didn't see anything when I looked outside of it. However, I didn't have a good feeling about it, because the house was so secluded, and most parts of it were surrounded by trees and bushes. I knew anybody being around here at all would be suspicious. As I walked back to the living room, my wife asked me if I saw what was causing the knocking. Just as I was telling her about it, we then heard a loud pounding coming from the front door. It sounded as though somebody was trying to break the entire door down. I walked back over to the kitchen area to try and look out the window and see, but once again, when I got at an angle to actually see who was at the front door, the noises had stopped and whoever was there was now gone. After this, we didn't hear any more noises for a while thought maybe whoever it was had now left. But about 30 minutes later, we heard the sound outside, just barely, of a man yelling. I couldn't tell what he was saying. In fact, I'm not sure if he was saying anything at all. We knew somebody was trying to mess with us, or get inside the house for some reason. We would hear noises or bangs against the house, but whenever we looked out the window, whoever was there somehow disappeared. This happened a couple of more times, and my wife and I were getting concerned. We didn't really feel comfortable going to bed with all this going on. It was getting late though, and I decided if we were in fact going to sleep there, I would go outside and take a look around. I went out the front door and took a walk all around the house, but saw nothing strange and didn't hear anything either. I hoped that meant whoever was there was now gone, and I went back inside. We decided we would go to bed, but if anything else happened at all, we would call the police immediately. Once we had both got to bed and turned out all the lights, Almost right away, there was a sudden sound of glass breaking coming from the opposite end of the house. My wife grabbed her phone and started calling the police. I shut the door and locked it and then started packing up all of our stuff. There was no chance I was going to continue to stay here with all of this going on. We didn't really hear any noises though as we waited for the police to arrive. 
It took them a while to reach the house with it being way out there, probably like 20 minutes. Thankfully, nobody tried to enter the bedroom we were in during that time. When the police arrived, my wife and I left the room with our bags packed. The police showed us a window in the living room of the house which had been broken and there was some glass on the ground around it, but after searching the house, they didn't find anybody inside. I didn't feel safe though. After the police left, my wife and I did the same and we checked into a hotel. A couple of years ago, I traveled to a city for a prospective job. I had a potential job offer and was going to stay a total of two days to look at the area in case I were to move there. I didn't really spend a whole lot of time looking for where to stay. I kind of just went onto the Airbnb app, found a place that looked good, and then went for it. I do remember though that the owner seemed like a really nice guy. When I arrived, the place itself was decent. It was a little place right by the city. I got the keys and got inside to drop off my stuff. After that, I went out for a few hours and then returned that night. I went to bed that night pretty early. I've always been kind of an early bird and I'm used to it. However, I woke up in seemingly the middle of the night, which is unusual. When I woke up, I looked around confused after seeing it was still dark outside and clearly nighttime. I looked at the clock to see that it was 2.30 a.m. And I remember, just as I was looking at the clock, I heard the sound of the front door to the house being opened. The house had been completely silent, and hearing that was a scary moment. I knew nobody else was supposed to be in the house. I'm not really sure what I was thinking. Maybe it was because I had just woken up and wasn't thinking clearly, but I grabbed the blankets and covered myself with them like a little kid. I then heard footsteps starting to come closer to the bedroom that I was in. My heart started to race like crazy, and I was terrified. I sort of came to my senses and knew that hiding under the covers was a bad idea, but what could I do? I had no time to prepare for this. As the footsteps got closer, it was clear to me that they would likely come in the bedroom. The only thing I thought to do was pretend to still be asleep. Maybe, just maybe, if somebody was going to rob the house or something like that, if they saw that I was fast asleep, they would just ignore me. I also felt this was my only option because I had no time to run to the closet and hide or grab something to use as a weapon. I didn't even have time to dial 911 as my phone was charging on the desk, not within my reach. Once whoever was there reached the door, I heard it open, and I closed my eyes and pretended to be sound asleep. I heard whoever was there take two steps inside the room or so, and then they just stopped. I didn't hear any more noises or movement for about a whole minute. Very carefully, I opened my eyes just a crack. I was careful to make it look like they were still closed, but I wanted to see whoever was in there. As soon as my eyes cracked open, I saw somebody standing right in front of the doorway, facing me. I looked at them for a couple of seconds, then I recognized them. It was the man who owned the Airbnb. I remembered him from his picture. He was just standing there staring at me with no expression on his face. I was careful to close my eyes without making it look like they had ever been open. I was terrified and also very confused as to what he was doing here. He stayed there for probably five more minutes and didn't move. It felt like forever and I was just waiting for him to do something. Finally, I heard him turn around and then walk away. I laid in bed, listening carefully to wherever the man moved throughout the house. He went straight for the door and then just left. After that, I stayed up for about two more hours before I could get back to sleep. Luckily, the guy never returned. The next day, I contacted the owner of the Airbnb and asked him what he was doing in the house during the night. He denied being there completely. I reported him after that and did not return back. That was the last time I used Airbnb. Disgusted and repulsed don't even begin to describe what I felt toward my ex-roommate. She was really something else. Moving into the dorms your freshman year of college is supposed to be one of those fun experiences in life. Something you look forward to all summer. Well, I look forward to it at least. Move-in day went well. I was a little disappointed when they told me that I wouldn't be having a roommate. I always envisioned my roommate becoming my best friend and doing everything together, but I guess that wasn't meant to be. The first half of the school year went great. I made plenty of friends and had gotten really used to having the room all to myself. When they told me I'd be getting a roommate in January, I was actually pretty bummed. 
I cleaned up the other half of the room to accommodate the girl that would be moving in and just hoped that we would get along. She came the second week of January when we had gotten back from winter break. She told me her name was Cassandra, but they should just call her Cassie. And Cassie didn't have much. She said it was because her parents never bought her anything and whatever she had, she had bought herself. I think she had maybe four boxes in total. I felt bad for her and told her that she could borrow some of my stuff if she ever needed to, but to ask first so I wouldn't think that I just lost it or something. And I quickly realized Cassie wasn't the average 18-year-old girl. She was different. First, she had horrible hygiene. I had to beg her a few times to take a shower in the nicest way possible because she would smell so bad that I actually would gag when I entered the room. She always thought it was kind of funny. She never washed her clothes, which also meant that the clothes that she would borrow of mine never got washed either. She would give me back my shirts with sweat stains and food covering the front. It was like this girl had never been taught any manners or basic social skills ever in her life. But the worst thing about Cassie was her obsession with eating raw meat. And I'm not kidding you. I walked in on her eating cuts of raw bacon one day, and she tried hiding it when I walked in, but there was no way that I could unsee that. I asked her why she was eating raw bacon, not to shame her or anything, but I just was genuinely morbidly curious, really grossed out obviously, but still curious. She said it was something that she'd always done growing up and that her parents ate raw meat too and that it was just a normal thing for her. I honestly thought it was completely disgusting, but I also was trying to be a good roommate and as nice as I could, so I told her as long as I didn't have to witness her eating it in front of me, I was cool with her keeping her raw meat in the mini fridge. I should never have said that. The next day I opened the mini fridge to find it full of pounds of pounds of meat. All different kinds too. Bacon, ground beef, different cuts of steak, and even some goat meat. When Cassie walked in and saw me staring into the fridge, she looked at me. She was smiling ear to ear, so proud of her meat stash. She bragged about the deals that she found and before I could stop her, she reached in front of me, grabbed a package of ground beef, opened it up and started shoving it into her mouth. I almost threw up right then. I was yelling at her to stop, and with meat still in her mouth, she just laughed. I reacted in horror when I felt bits of it land near me, and that only made her laugh harder. The next day, I requested a room change. I couldn't take it, but I was told that that would only be possible in the next two weeks. I was fine with that as long as it meant that I could escape the nightmare that was this disgusting person known as Cassie. She really freaked me out. I told her she wasn't allowed to borrow my stuff anymore since she never returned anything in a good enough state for me to use anyways. She was upset but seemed to understand. We didn't talk much the week after I requested a room change. She continued to stash all her meat in the fridge but at least she wasn't eating it in front of me anymore. A couple of days before I was due to move out of the room I was sitting at my desk next to Cassie when she walked out of the room. I got a call from one of my friends and leaned back as we talked. I was looking around the room when my eyes settled on her computer. One of the tabs had three words that read, Wanted. Fresh meat. I laughed and told my friend what I saw. He told me to click on it and see what it was because he was curious. And I never in my wildest dreams would have expected to see what was on there. When I clicked on the tab, my laughing quickly halted. My friend was asking me over and over what it was, but I was too scared to even speak. It was an ad that she had posted on a website I had never even heard of, and the fresh meat that she was looking for wasn't from a cow or a pig or a goat. She had posted a wanted ad for fresh, human meat. In the ad, she carefully explained how she liked eating raw meat and had always dreamed about what human meat would taste like. She seemed to be obsessed with it. One line completely caught me off guard and made me want to join the witness protection program immediately, and in it she said, Eating human flesh has consumed my every thought. Sometimes I watch my roommate sleeping and fantasize about chewing on her. I took a picture of the ad on my phone and clicked off of it so she wouldn't notice I was on her computer. I grabbed my bag and headed out, telling my friend to meet me at the police station immediately. I told them everything and showed them the picture of the ad. In conjunction with the university and their concern, they spoke to Cassie about this. And surprisingly, she admitted to everything. They took it as far as actually testing all the meat in the fridge since we lived on campus, but thankfully, 
it was all either beef or pork. I was able to get a restraining order against her and she was expelled from the university for apparently accessing the dark web while using the school's Wi-Fi and for attempting to engage in illegal activities. Now for a while, people actually compared Cassie to that German guy, Armin Maiwis, who cannibalized a person who volunteered to be eaten. Who knows if she really would have gone through with it though. I don't think Cassie was ever charged for what she did. I tried to distance myself from her as much as possible. Hearing her name five years later would still be too soon. After her arrest, I just never saw her again. I think she must have just moved away out of embarrassment for what she did, but she was expelled from the school, and the entire town knew who she was and what she did. There would have been no escaping the whispers and dirty looks, and I do hope that she got the help she clearly needed. I still don't know how anyone could survive eating raw meat like the way she did. I ended up getting a new roommate after that who was perfectly normal, maybe even a little boring in some ways, but that was totally okay with me. I'll take boring over a cannibal any day. What I'm about to tell you happened a little over a year ago, so it's still all pretty fresh in my mind. I was 18 and a girl in my class named Kendra was having a really hard time at home. Her parents fought all the time and she always talked about how much she wished she could just disappear. She confided in my mom, who was a teacher at the high school we went to, and my mom offered to let her stay with us. Only we didn't have an extra bedroom so that meant that she'd be staying with me as a roommate. I was really upset. My mom moved most of my furniture out to make room for another bed. Kendra was 18 too, which meant that she didn't have to get permission from her parents to leave, so she moved in pretty quickly. I noticed right away that something was off with her. She would spend hours sitting in front of the mirror, just smiling at herself. I would ask her what she was doing, and she always responded that she was practicing. Only, she wouldn't say for what. Most nights, I'd hear her in the bathroom talking to herself, seriously having full-on conversations, and it really freaked me out. But when I told my mom, she just said Kendra was awkward and having a tough time and for me to be nice. Kendra and I never became close. She made it very clear that she didn't like me. She ignored me constantly and would express anger whenever I'd hang out with my mom without her. Her jealousy turned into something really weird the day she dyed her hair to look like mine. She even went to the same hairdresser I go to and gave her a picture of me to go off of. She was open about it too. I continued to complain to my mom about her, now copying the way that I look, but again she told me to just be nice and put up with it because Kendra was having a very hard life. Weeks went by and the copying got worse. She would repeat everything I said, but in different voices, almost like she was trying to mimic the way I sounded. She started using my clothes too, and no matter how much I told my mom it creeped me out, she always told me to just go along with it for a while. I started feeling uncomfortable in my own home. I hated being in my room with her. The worst nights were when I would wake up to Kendra standing at the foot of my bed. Sometimes she'd be staring at me. She'd smirk when I expressed a sense of fear. And after a few months of her living with us, I decided to start sleeping in the living room to try to escape the awkwardness of sharing a room with a person I had started to believe was a legitimate sociopath. The living room proved to be not too much better though. She would still watch me sleep from the armchair across from the sofa and laugh when I woke up, scared of what she might do to me in my sleep. My mom never believed me when I told her what she was doing during the night. She told me Kendra always denied it and that I was probably making the whole thing up to try to get her kicked out of the house. I was done at this point. I decided one night that I was going to set up a camera to catch her in the act so I could show my mom and Kendra would be gone for good. That night... I set my phone on record and positioned it so it would hopefully be out of sight. I never expected to see what I saw the next morning when I went to check what I'd caught from the night before. I watched as Kendra slowly and quietly made her way down the stairs towards the sofa I was fast asleep on. She stood at the end of the sofa for a whole 30 minutes before she sat down in the armchair to watch me for another hour. Then she made her way into the kitchen. With wide eyes, I watched as she came back into the room with a large knife. She walked towards me and bent down to whisper something in my ear. Then she laughed and held up the knife above her head like she was going to stab me with it. Then she brought it down quickly, but stopped, just away from my face. 
I screamed when I saw her head turn to look directly into the camera. I wanted to cry when I heard her say, You actually thought I didn't know what that was there? I know everything that happens in this house. Remember that. She then walked toward the phone and turned the video off. I immediately rushed upstairs to tell my mom, but instead was struck in the chest with a wooden baseball bat. It was Kendra. I screamed at her and asked her what she was doing while trying to catch my breath, but she looked at me with no emotion on her face at all. She started to drag me into my room, and as I was in that daze from getting struck, she began to tie me to the desk chair. She told me I didn't deserve the life I had. I shouldn't have been given a loving family when she was given an awful one. The goosebumps that went through my body confirmed what I was thinking when she said, You don't appreciate the life you've been given, so I'm taking it. I started shaking uncontrollably, begging her to let me live. She laughed and told me that she wasn't going to kill me. She was just going to live as me for a while. I didn't really know how that was possible, but I decided it was best not to antagonize the crazy person right in front of me. And I was already pretty sure that she'd broken a few of my ribs with a bat and I didn't want her to pick it up again and continue where she left off. She dragged me, still tied to the chair, and put me in the closet and closed the door. I could still see her through the cracks and cringed when she put on more of my clothes and styled her hair to match mine. Finally, I could hear the sound of the door opening and my mother coming home from work. She called out my name and I started screaming for her to help me. Kendra opened the closet door and told me to be quiet or she'd hurt my mom, so I shut my mouth. I watched as my mom burst into the room and asked her where I was since she'd heard me calling for help. I started to feel sick when Kendra said, but mommy, it is me. My mom looked at her with pure confusion and asked her what she meant, and Kendra kept repeating herself. It's me. Don't you recognize your daughter? I saw my mom's face drain of color when she asked Kendra what she'd done to me, and that's when Kendra had enough. She shoved my mother to the ground and screamed in her face that she was her daughter and she needed to act like it. My mom got up slowly and as nicely as she could, she says, Oh my goodness, I, I don't know what's got into me today. Of course you're my daughter. Let's make, a, let's make some tea. Just stay right there. She left the room and Kendra opened the closet door to tell me her plan was working and that my mom believed her. I of course knew that clearly wasn't the case and that Kendra had lost her mind. I was 100% positive my mother was downstairs calling the police. But I wasn't going to tell Kendra that though. My mom came back upstairs 15 minutes later and told Kendra that T was downstairs and to please join her. Kendra and my mom left the room and within seconds, I heard the police entering and her being arrested. My mom found me in the closet soon after and untied me. She immediately apologized for never believing me and in that moment, I was just happy to be in my mother's arms. Kendra was charged with assault with a deadly weapon at first but was deemed unfit to stand trial. Instead, she was sent to a mental facility where they'd assess her condition further to decide whether or not she should be a danger to herself or others. She was sentenced to spend at least three years in that facility before she'd have the chance to get out. All in all, the experience was truly a nightmare, but I also couldn't help but feeling at least a little sorry for Kendra. She was never given a chance in her life to grow into anything but what she became. She may have been the scariest roommate I'd truly ever had, but I don't blame her. I blame her horrible parents. If they had just given her the life she deserved, I doubt that wherever her mental health started to deteriorate, it may have never actually gone down that route. A couple months in her stay in that facility, I got a letter from Kendra in the mail. In it, she told me that she was on medication and had plenty of time to think about what she did. She apologized and expressed how much she hoped I could forgive her. I actually wrote her back telling her I had already forgiven her and that I hope she continues to get the help that she needs and that there was no hard feelings between us. And even though I have forgiven her, I'd be lying if I said that there wasn't still a part of me that's scared of what she might do when she does eventually get out. My brother is a 16-year-old boy who's thin, weak, and short. 
On the other hand, I'm an 18-year-old male. I'm athletically built and tall. My parents had recently been hired for new jobs at our local clinic, and they were really struggling with time management. This left me and my brother most of the time home alone, which we understood, and we had no problem with it. However, one night in particular, I was obligated by my school to attend a camp that one of my extracurricular clubs was hosting in a different city not too far away. Ultimately, I decided I really wanted to go, as most of my friends had already confirmed they would be going as well. I decided not to tell my parents about the club. I mean, I'm already 18, and I believed it was unnecessary to ask for permission. Now that I think about it though, not asking for permission is yet to this day my worst decision ever. As night fell and my parents departed to their workplace, I began telling my brother everything he needed to know before I left that afternoon. He seemed hesitant at first, but soon realized I was extremely excited to finally leave our small town and explore something new. He promised everything would be alright and that he wouldn't tell our parents he'd be alone until the next morning. Before leaving, I acknowledged how selfish I was being and the potential harm that my brother could possibly face. I texted one of my friends who had previously told me she was willing to babysit as a side hustle. I explained the situation, and immediately she agreed to stay over and watch for my younger sibling. I told my brother about the girl that he'd let in, and the reasoning behind her presence. I felt relieved, but still felt guilty. My ride showed up, and I eventually left before the babysitter even arrived. Later that night, I received various text messages from my brother. However, I decided to ignore them as I was busy unpacking most of my stuff, and those messages were probably weird and funny TikToks that he usually sends me. Well, around 12 a.m., I got a phone call from him. I silently picked up the phone, trying to avoid waking up everyone who was already asleep, and instantly felt the world turn upside down when I heard loud crying and breathing. That was all I heard for the first 20 seconds until I finally called out again. Hello? Who is this? Are you okay? Finally, my brother replied. JJ, there's people in the house looking for the girl. She's hiding somewhere, and they know I'm here. I'm scared. I initially thought it could be a prank, as it sounded so weird and almost pulled out of a horror movie. Nevertheless, the crying and breathing said otherwise. I told my brother to stay hidden and to call the cops. As I was talking to him though, I had heard a gunshot in the background, followed by a sound of screaming and yelling. At this point, my brother had begged me to return and to call my parents. So I did, and I then explained as fast as I could. They immediately questioned me, but I told them there wasn't much time left and they had to go back home. Meanwhile, I was trying to get one of the teachers to drive me back home. Luckily, he agreed after hearing my very detailed story amidst my panic attack. Once I arrived home, there were infinite cop cars and many ambulances near the premises of our house. My brother was unharmed, but in a shocked state. I apologized profusely and I tried to comfort him while being scolded by my parents. To this day, I'm unaware of the reasoning behind the events that unfolded on my house that particular day. No casualties were found, only several bullet holes around the house. I learned to not ever trust anyone, or at least have a background check for the people I let in my house, especially when my little brother is alone. I'll be sure to provide an update if something else comes up. I genuinely doubt there will ever be one, as I reside in a small town and the police are sometimes not as helpful as we assume they are. Stay safe. And remember that sometimes not everything goes as planned. The moral of the story is to not be selfish. Well, for me anyways. My name is Thomas. One night, my friend for privacy reasons who we'll call Aaron was home alone for the weekend because his parents had left for a business trip. So he called me over and he asked if I wanted to have a sleepover. I had rode my bike around 7.30, entering from the back gate and from his back door, I had then greeted him, 
and we ordered a pizza and played quite a few video games. We eventually got bored, so we watched a movie. Halfway throughout the movie, we decided to ding-dong ditch a few houses. After many laughs, we head back to Aaron's house. After a few minutes, we had heard a banging coming from the front door. We were shocked, but when we opened the door and there was no one there, we had saw a note that then read, I'm coming for you. So we shut the door so fast, locking it from the top lock and the bottom one. Now, Aaron lives in a two-story house, so keep that in mind. Neither one of us knew what to do, but we calmed down after we stated it could be a prank on us from the people in our school because there was actually a prank war going on. So, about another half hour into the movie, we both froze due to the sound of the front door then turning, when both of us just started thinking again about the creepy note we had gotten. When we both raced into his room, which is on the second floor. Oh shit, dude, I forgot to lock the door, I said. As I said that, we had heard the back gate begin opening. Aaron was aggressively telling me to go lock it. When I went to the back door, I could then see a silhouette of about a six foot tall man looking inside through the door, but I don't think he saw me in return. Aaron had come down and caught up with me when I then signaled to him to go back to the room. We went into the room and we shut the door, but it had no lock due to his strict parents. I told him to call the cops and his parents, but he said no that he wasn't allowed to have anyone over for the weekend, and he didn't want to get in trouble, so we had no choice but to hide under his bed. We began to then hear what sounded like the house being completely ransacked, things being thrown around and broken, doors slamming, etc. Then it got worse, even more terrifying than it already was. We began to hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Aaron's door then slowly opened, we had heard the closet open and then clothes being moved around. And then, he just seemed to stop. The bed we were hiding under had a huge blanket over it that hung all the way down to the ground level. So, unless someone moved the blanket, you couldn't see us. Twenty minutes later, I'd asked Aaron, Dude, do you think we can run yet and get the f*** out of here? But then, before I could even react... Aaron was then immediately dragged from underneath the bed, to which I then heard the most disturbing, ear-shattering scream which Aaron let out while being dragged from under the bed. It was right then and there that I knew I had to f***ing do something or someone was going to die that night. I got out from under the bed to see Aaron struggling to get loose from the six-foot psycho's death grip. I desperately searched the house to find something to use as a weapon. I found a screwdriver. I ran back upstairs charging towards the man and made absolutely sure I stabbed him and got the screwdriver fully through his back. He then let out a blood-curdling scream, letting go of Aaron. We quickly ran out to Aaron's backyard, which led to the very dark woods. We then hid in some bushes near the entrance of the forest. We saw the man leaving the back gate, now holding a knife, which I guess he took from the kitchen. I felt his eyes pass me, when Aaron then whispered, We gotta run. To which I then replied back with, Why the f*** would we run now? We've came this far. Might as well keep going. But dude, he's coming right at us. Aaron said. And he was right. The man was running straight towards us. I still to this day don't know how he saw us in the pitch black like he did. Aaron had lived in the countryside of town. So the neighbors were about one to two miles away, and the road was a straight path, so he could easily see us. My lungs felt like they were on fire, and I ended up falling because of a tree root sticking out. Aaron stayed with me, trying to pick me up, but the man was right behind us, and he was at least seven feet away from us. I could clearly see him in a tall black hoodie and white sweatpants. I don't know how, but this time luck was finally on our side. It seemed that this time he didn't see us. He then ran off in the other direction, and we sprinted even faster. I was the slower one, but I swear I could hear leaves crunching behind us. We entered the back gate, making sure to lock it. Remember before how Aaron was too scared to call his parents or the cops because of the repercussions of him getting in trouble? 
Yeah, well, that. I told Aaron to call the damn cops already, that it's gotten too bad. We need the help. And with much hesitation, we finally called them. I stayed on the lookout to see if I saw the man coming back. It was so dark out and I couldn't see a thing, but I then did something so regrettably stupid. I shined the flashlight in the woods when I saw it. I saw his dark, tall silhouette. I thought he was going to run directly towards us yet again, but no, he just turned around and ran back into the dark woods. The cops arrived and they searched the property, but they didn't find him. They only found the missing kitchen knife he took. The cops claimed there was going to be an investigation, but with not much to go off besides the knife, I really doubt much was ever done. And if there was, we never got an update on it. My guess is the guy's still out there somewhere, wreaking havoc. But yeah, that's the story of how me and my best friend Aaron almost died while home alone together. Stay safe, everyone, and make sure to lock the doors and windows at all times. It just may end up saving your life someday. This event lasted less than five minutes, but was still one of the scariest moments of my life. My aunt and uncle, who were both major junkies, moved into our house when I was around nine years old. Though I really looked up to my aunt, I was always very uncomfortable around my uncle, who was to put in nicely the epitome of abusive white trash that one may imagine. He was skeleton thin from drugs, had a shaved head, covered in poorly done vulgar and racist tattoos, and to top it off, he had missing and rotting teeth. He was always drunk or high, and definitely wasn't good around kids. Well, one evening, my mother went out with my aunt, so my uncle was there, though he wasn't our usual assigned babysitter. Cass, my twin, and I had been taking care of ourselves and my little brother for years at that point, and we were certainly more mature than my uncle could ever be with all of his missing brain cells. Cass and I were hanging out in the living room while my brother slept upstairs in his room. My uncle suddenly came staggering out of his room, which was directly next to the living room. He squinted his eyes like he didn't recognize us. Now, we weren't afraid at all of our uncle, but we definitely weren't about to listen to him. Our uncle had then tried to kick us out of the living room, but we didn't have a TV in our room, so I'm sure that I said something that made him angry. More than likely telling him we didn't have to listen to him and that he had his own TV in his room. He marched back into his room, and I thought that was that. But then, he came back in holding a pillow from his bed. Before I could even begin to comprehend his intentions, he had stomped across the room and then pinned me to the couch, fully holding the pillow over my head. Even writing this, I can feel my heart pounding, and I'm having trouble completely catching my breath. I couldn't breathe, and I just remember throwing my hands about frantically trying to pull his hands off. I had bit my nails as a kid, so I couldn't even dig my nails into him. I was gasping for air and quickly losing consciousness when I then heard my sister screaming. I was about to fully black out when the weight lightened and I was able to throw it off, gasping like a fish out of water. Cass had jumped onto his back and he had flung her off panting hard with such a cold look in his eyes as he staggered back. My uncle stormed out of the house, cursing at us, and we immediately locked the glass bag door behind him. We sobbed and held each other, sitting in the middle of the living room. We fell asleep wrapped in each other's arms, and we only woke up when the front door unlocked and then opened a few hours later. We ran to meet my mother and aunt at the front door, but they were both drunk off their asses and were giggling and shushing each other as they staggered in. I knew that they'd be no real help now, but Cass explained and my mom was actually overly nice when she was drunk. So she then hugged us and began crying, telling us how much she loved us, which was a rarity. She and my aunt stayed up with us, them still drinking, and they turned on a horror movie and gave us each a shot. I know what you're thinking, but even at nine years old, we weren't about to turn that down. When my uncle began banging on the glass bag door at 4 a.m., 
My aunt staggered over and told him to go f*** himself and to sleep outside for the night. He didn't come back for three days, but when he did, he acted like nothing had ever happened and he avoided us like the plague. So dear readers, don't trust someone with your kid just because they're family, especially if they're family like mine. You never know what someone is truly capable of, especially in a moment of rage. This probably won't seem very scary to most, but it's one of the scariest moments of my life. If my sister hadn't have intervened, I truly believe he would have possibly killed me. Even more than 10 years later, I still wake up sometimes gasping for air, like it may be my last. At the time, I had just turned 12. I had never been left home alone before, and I was really excited to finally be home alone without adult supervision. I began the night by binging movies and playing games on the PlayStation, which my parents had bought me for Christmas. It was still very early in January when this happened. My town had been experiencing a harsh winter that year. It was snowing heavily outside to the point that if you looked outside, you wouldn't even be able to see. I had just put in a frozen pizza in the oven when the doorbell rang. My parents had always told me to not answer the door for anyone because they have a key and they wouldn't need to be let in. I was a curious kid, so despite my best judgment, I went to look out the peephole. However, when I did so, there was no one there. In all honesty, I just brushed it off as someone had the wrong house and left. The more I thought about it, though, the more suspicious I became. As like I said, it was below freezing and it was snowing outside. I went back to the living room to watch my movies. It's important to note that we had just moved in and we didn't have any curtains in some of the windows including the window that looked into our living room. At this point, I heard a loud bang come from the kitchen. I assumed something had fell, and as tired as I was, I didn't go see what it was. What I finally had, I had noticed my pizza had been overcooked. I threw it in the trash, and when I had gone back into the living room, I had then noticed someone looking into the living room. I pretended that I didn't see them and tried to discreetly call my parents. To the horror of my 12-year-old heart, they didn't answer. I tried not to panic and I just went into my parents' bedroom and locked all the doors. I crawled under the bed and once again tried reaching out to my parents. When they did finally answer, I told them what happened and they rushed home. But by the time they got home, Whoever was outside was long gone. I have no idea who it was that was outside or what their intentions were, but I really hope they don't ever return. Hi, my name is Trevor, and this is by far the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. This happened in May of this year. I'm a 22-year-old male who's in pretty good shape and I'm a first responder, so I've seen and dealt with pretty much everything. I live with my parents in an upper middle class community. The town I live in has very little to no crime in it. So here's my story. My parents left to go to Florida to visit some family and basically left me and my German Shepherd dog alone for the week. A quick layout of the house, it's two stories, with my parents' room on the first floor. Anyways, it's night out, and I'm sleeping in my parents' room with my dog. The bed is between two windows with screens on them. They were both opened. It's about 2 a.m., and I'm just getting ready to fall asleep when I wake up to the sounds of screaming. I think nothing of it since there's a lot of kids in the area who are always out. But about 10 minutes later, I hear the same screaming again, which woke my dog up, and he was also alerted. I still think nothing of it. Another 10 minutes, the screaming happens again, 
and I noticed it wasn't a child's scream, and it was only one person. It was a loud screaming sounded like someone was getting stabbed. My dog starts huffing and totally freaking out. I'm now scared shitless and unable to move. Five minutes later, and the screaming was right outside the window. It was so loud this time that my ears started ringing. My dog flips absolute shit, and I'm having a panic attack. I look out the window, and I see some old woman with long gray hair, and she was still screaming. I finally jump into action, and I grab my dad's pistol. The only bad thing is that it was a revolver, and it had no bullets, so I had to pray she thought it was loaded. I went back to the window, and now she was gone. I dialed 911, and as soon as the operator answered, I then heard the front door glass break. I ran over, and I see this old woman reaching into the window trying to unlock it. The scariest part of all of this was that her arm was rubbing right against the broken glass, cutting her very deep, but she wasn't even reacting to it. She was giving me the thousand yard stare while laughing and screaming. <laughs> I'm literally crying at this point, and I had pointed the gun right at her. She sees the gun, and then just starts yelling. Do it! I dare you! And as much as I wanted to, I couldn't since I had no bullets. And then suddenly, I then see lights going down my street. The woman pulls her arm away and starts walking back slowly while still staring at me and laughing. I can then hear the cops yelling, Drop the knife, ma'am! The cops took my statement, and I later found out that she was actually a psych patient who had escaped the hospital, and that she even broke into a trailer nearby and stabbed a couple. The last I heard, they were okay, but why my house out of all the others? I had my door fixed and all the blood cleaned up. My parents later called me because they had heard that there was a break-in in the area. I had to tell them it was our house, but to not worry. To that crazy old who tried stabbing me, I hope you're getting the proper care and help that you need. This happened when I was 15. I was visiting my dad for the weekend as I tend to do often. My half-brother lives with them, and we're very close, and I consider him a full brother. We usually don't do much when I'm over in my father's house. We just hang out and have a good time. Me and my brother play video games in his room mostly, and this time was no different, until later in the story. Earlier in the day, my dad had some friends over, and we were all outside. We were playing some basketball in the back with all the adults. I had overheard my dad telling them how a few weeks earlier, one of his acquaintances came up to my brother's window and had tried to take out the new AC that my dad had just installed. My dad punched him a few times and injured his hand doing so. We all thought the situation was pretty funny and we had a little laugh about it and that was pretty much the end of it. A couple of hours later, everyone left and we went inside while my brother put his dog in the outdoor cage. He usually stays out there for a couple of hours. Keep that in mind, because it'll be important later. That night, our dad had let us know that he was going to be going out for a few hours, and he gave us the usual spiel. Don't open the door for anyone you don't know. Remember to bring the dog back inside, and don't f*** anything up. And yes, those were his exact words. We gave him the okay, and he was off. Me and my brother were in his room playing some video games and watching some YouTube when the doorbell rang. Me and him just looked at each other, and I told him to go look out the window next to the door and see who it was. I continued playing the game, and I heard my brother open the door. So I assumed it was someone we knew. About a minute went by when I heard it close again, and my brother walked back into the room. I had asked him who it was, and he told me it was Roy. He was the one who my dad beat up. 
At that point, I was getting a little nervous, and I got upset with my brother for even opening the door for him after what he did. I was confused, and I had asked him why he did that. I had told him what happened, and his face then turned into a look of worry. I then asked my brother what he was talking to Roy about. He went on to explain that Roy had asked if our dad was home. Unfortunately, my brother said no, and Roy just left without saying a word. I can't blame my brother for telling him, because he didn't know at the time. My brother then ran to the kitchen and grabbed two knives just to be safe. We closed the bedroom door, and we continued playing games. About 15 minutes later, we thought we heard some noises coming from outside. Now, we had the window cracked open because it was summer, and my brother's room always got boiling hot. We both walked over, and then slightly peeled open the curtains, but we didn't see anything. We just blamed it on the paranoia getting to us, and then one of the scariest moments of my life then happened. The bag motion sensor light turned on, and the dog started to bark extremely loud, as if the barks were directed at something or someone. Me and my brother's eyes grew ten times in size. Not only did we forget the dog, but there was something in the backyard. We knew it was a person due to the Roy situation, and the fact that it takes a lot of movement to activate the motion light. We tried to wait it out to see if the dog would start barking, but it didn't. So we then knew we had to go out there and get him. With knives in hand, both me and my brother carefully made our way outside. I was watching him in the door while I grabbed the dog. The dog was facing away from the house deeper into the yard where the light didn't hit, so we knew where whoever was out there was. Just as my brother got the dog untied and was about to run back inside, Roy jumped out from the darkness with a hatchet from my dad's shed, running full speed toward my brother. I screamed at him to look out, but he caught his arm. As my brother struggled to keep Roy from lowering the hatchet onto him, I then ran over and slit Roy's arm with a knife. He dropped the hatchet and then screamed in pain. Me, my brother, and the dog all ran inside and locked everything down. We considered calling the police, but in the end, we decided not to. It would just be one of those things that we always kept between us and no one else. But nonetheless, this is still one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me and my brother. And I really hope no one else has to experience anything like it. This is going to be a short but terrifying story, and it happened to me when I was 15. It still horrifies me to the very second I'm writing this. I was home alone one night during the summer of 2019, and I was doing my normal relaxation activities. You know, TV and video games. My parents were out on a date, and my older brother was at his friend's house, and I had no pets. I was playing Battlefront 2 when I heard two guys talking outside my window. My window was facing the backyard, so it kind of scared me. I turned off my Xbox and then looked out my window. What I saw made my heart beat itself right out of my body. I saw six guys in my backyard armed with machetes and wearing these weird cat masks, and they were about to bring my window with this giant rock. I grabbed my phone, ran into my room, locked the door, and then called my dad. I told him what was happening, but for some reason, he didn't even believe me. I was furious, so I then hung up on him and called 911. By then, I could hear the men in my house, and they were talking in a language that sounded like Russian. The operator then told me that the officers would be there soon and to stay where I was. She then told me to hang up, which I did. It wasn't even a minute later that I heard two pairs of footsteps coming up the stairs and then to my room. They tried the doorknob, and when they realized it was locked, they then yelled something to the other men. They then started bashing at the door and kicking it, and then I think they actually tried cutting it open with their machetes. 
They eventually gave up, and I then heard a window outside my room opening. So I guess they escaped. I just stayed in my room, when I then heard a man shout, Police! I opened my door and rushed downstairs, when I saw three cops in my living room. They told me the place was clear, and that it was safe. They called my parents, and this time they actually believed it, and came home. The cops had actually told us that this wasn't the first time this happened, and that within the last week only, there had been three other incidents exactly like this. This only made me angrier with my dad, as since this had happened before, he should have believed me even more, but still didn't for some reason. I didn't talk to my dad for days before he finally made it up to me. Parents, please believe your children when they come to you with things like this. It isn't something to be taken lightly. So, about four years ago, my parents were going out. And with that, I was going to be home all alone for at least three to four hours. They left around six and they said they would be home around nine to twelve. Whenever they left, I went downstairs. I got some snacks and I had put on Netflix to then look around for a new show. After like two hours of watching a new show, that's when I then heard a very strange noise coming from the front porch. Keep in mind, I have a wraparound porch and there were a lot of windows looking out. Me being curious, I pulled back the curtains and then looked out into the dark yard. After looking around, nothing seemed off, until I saw a black silhouette of a man standing by the front door. I froze in fear, dropping the curtains, and then ran upstairs into my parents' room. After five minutes of waiting, I decided to text my parents. I told them the incident, and surprise, surprise, they didn't believe me, given that I was only 13. I sat there and I thought maybe it was my imagination. I decided to walk back downstairs and finish my show. I realized the motion sensor light in the backyard was now on. You can either turn the light on, or if anyone walks by it, it will turn on automatically. Keep in mind then, this light isn't very sensitive. Most time it turns on whenever a person or animal walks by it. Once I realized what was going on, I ran back to my parents' room, once again in tears. I picked up the house phone to call the police, when I then heard a whisper from outside my window. Hey, I know you're in there. Just come out. Come out here real quick. I just want to talk to you. My heart dropped and was about to be right out of my chest. I froze in fear then snapped back and called the police. The 911 operator told me to hide in a closet and to stay quiet. She told me to stay in the line just in case anything else happens. Also, keep in mind that my house is around 15 minutes away from the nearest town. After sitting in my parents' closet, I heard the back door creak. Tears started rolling as I then heard someone walking around in the kitchen and living room. I told the 911 operator what was happening, and then I heard something fall over downstairs. Then I heard the stairs creaking, and a man walking around the bedrooms. Thank God I locked the bedroom door, because he saw it was locked, and just kept going. Or so I thought. Well, after around 30 seconds, I heard the loudest bang of my life, and with a man screaming, and like a miracle. Right after this, I then heard police sirens, and the man running away, and then the back door slamming shut. I ran out, and I saw him running into the woods. I ran outside, and I told the cops everything, and then they took me to my aunt's house, where I waited at for my parents to come home. Ever since this happened, they never did find the man, considering we never really got any details on him. I pray and hope he never returns. A 
I moved into a new apartment last fall. The apartment was, for the most part, pretty average. I had a one bedroom on the first floor. It was a corner unit, which was nice. I had a bedroom, bathroom, living room, and kitchen. I was moving into a new state for work and had lived about two hours away. When I got to the place, it took me a whole day to move all of my furniture in, but I was able to do it with the help of a coworker. That night though, something kind of weird happened. I was up pretty late because it was a weekend and after moving in all of my stuff, I was staying up late by myself watching a movie. At about midnight, I heard a noise coming from outside my door leading to the hallway. It was a man's voice and it sounded like he was saying, Jane. He was seemingly calling out for somebody named Jane. At first, I was sort of creeped out. Then I thought maybe it was just somebody walking down the hall or one of my neighbors going to their places. I paused the TV and got up, taking a couple of more steps closer to the door. I still heard the man's voice and I could tell now that it was coming from right outside of my door and he wasn't moving. Whoever was here must either be one of my neighbors or somebody looking for whoever used to live in my apartment. That's what I was thinking, and whoever did live in my apartment before must have been named Jane. I decided to go out and let this guy know that Jane doesn't live here anymore, and I just moved in. I walked over to the door and opened it, but as I was opening the door, I heard footsteps darting away as if the man was sprinting back down the hallway. When I had opened up the door, I could see down the hallway that the man was gone but I did just barely see him disappearing around the corner. Why would he try to run away from me? I thought this was pretty strange, but what else could I do? So I went back inside and unpaused my movie. Fast forward to about a week after that. This time, I was in bed sleeping, but was awoken in the middle of the night by a noise. My room was all dark and it was completely silent, except for a voice. Once again, I heard someone calling out, Jane, this guy again? What did he want, and who was he? More importantly, where was he? He wasn't outside my door again, or I wouldn't have been able to hear him. It took me a second because I had just woken up, but I realized that whoever it was was right outside my bedroom window. I sat up in bed and looked out the window. I saw some guy disappearing out of my view again. I never got a good look at him at all. Now I was really creeped out. This must be some type of mistake. I stayed up wide awake. I got up and went into my kitchen to get some water. When I was there, I heard another noise coming from the bedroom window. It was like a scratching noise, sort of. I went back into my bedroom, just in time to see that the guy was there again. I saw his face for a good second, and he saw mine. It looked as though maybe he was trying to break in. When he saw me, he stopped, and then ran away again. From what I saw, he was either bald or had really short hair, and was sort of short and stocky. I stayed up, not sure what to do. The guy seemed to be gone now, but I didn't know if he would come back. I stayed up basically for the entire rest of the night. The man never returned though. The next day, I contacted my apartment and told them about it, and then I went to the police. I was told they would patrol the area. However, the man never did come back. I still wonder who it was. Part of me thinks this guy was stalking a woman named Jane who he thought lived there. Either that, or maybe the guy was crazy, or maybe he was stalking me. I really don't know what to make of it. I'm a 23-year-old male and currently a graduate student at a large university that I want to keep anonymous. To preface this story, I live in a large apartment complex on the fourth story just a few blocks from campus. And even though the apartment is nice, the area is not. There are lower income projects directly across the street from my apartment and there are constant police patrols around the area as there are multiple convicted felons living there. I'm very high up from the ground on the fourth floor and far from the stairwell and feel relatively safe until one night. This all happened on the night of my 23rd birthday and I was coming back to my apartment late. I was pretty tired after all the events and fun that I had, so I just changed out of my clothes and into my boxers and went to sleep. To add more context, I had recently put out a lot of nice small Christmas trees, lights, and decorations, and the whole balcony looked very nice. I could turn the Christmas decor on and off using my computer, so before I went to sleep, I turned off all the lighting. This made my balcony and apartment pitch black. I went to bed and fell asleep pretty quickly. Everything was quiet until all of a sudden I was awoken to a loud noise that sounded like a fence railing rattling. I have a pet rabbit and she sometimes rattles the fence whenever she wants something. I also have a pet camera in my living room area, so I opened up the app on my phone to see what she wanted. However, when I checked the live footage, 
My rabbit was fast asleep and far from the fencing. I then thought someone must be out on their balcony and accidentally knocked over a plant or something, so I opened up my bedroom door to see what was going on. However, when I turned my head to look out at my balcony, I was jump scared by a medium-sized man with a backwards baseball hat and camo on. I was in pure shock and immediately went back into my room to call the police. After I knew the police were on their way, I poked my head around the door and yelled at the guy to get the F off my balcony. He didn't seem phased by this and tried to convince me that he was stuck and to let him in so he could get off of my balcony. However, I wasn't born yesterday and there was no way I was letting this guy on my balcony into my apartment at four in the morning. The guy kept talking and said his name is Charlie and I just finally had enough and said that he's lucky he's still standing there. This was enough for him to climb down the side rail of my balcony and onto the third floor. Later, I got a call from the police and asked about his description, but as of now, I haven't heard if he got caught. I filed the police report and they're currently looking for him. The crazy part about this story is that I live on the fourth floor, so I'm over 40 feet up in the air and there's about a 12 foot gap of open air between the apartment balconies vertically. There's also a 40 foot gap between my balcony and the stairs on each side. Aside from damaging a cheap flag, he did not steal any of my expensive Christmas decorations. I found this very odd that he wasn't on my balcony just to steal my decorations. Since the incident, I happened to run into some people that live in the building. I told them about how the guy tried to break in and enter my apartment, and I probably scared them badly when I told them this. I recommended that they reinforce their doors with something to keep them shut. That night, I installed an extra camera for the balcony and went to sleep. I didn't hear or see anything when I checked my camera the next day. However, someone claimed that the guy came back and tried to break down their door but couldn't because of the reinforcement. This scared me a lot because now I knew the person was not there just to steal furniture off balconies. The next night, nothing happened. When I woke up the next day, an idea popped into my head to check the roof area. There's a roof access area in the complex, so I went up and checked it. I didn't see anything at first, but I noticed how one of the planters were pulled out just slightly. This was extremely odd because you had to look at a specific angle to see that this large planter was pulled out. Also, I go up there fairly frequently and it's usually very clean and orderly. When I looked behind the planter, I was completely horrified. I found a large and heavy brick that looked like it weighed 30 pounds behind the planter. For reference, our apartment building is not made of brick and when I looked at some brick buildings in the area, I noticed that the brick I found was a lot larger and more malformed than the bricks on the buildings. I immediately called the police and they looked around on the rooftop that night to see if there was any more evidence, but they said they didn't find anything. The officer told me to dispose of the brick as they wouldn't be able to get fingerprints off of the surface. It's the next day now and I know that nothing else happened since last night. However, when I checked the rooftop again, I found another brick, but this time it was hidden in a plant with tall grass. I think he noticed the last brick was gone and went to get another one. I've been really stressed out about this and have not been able to sleep for the past few days. I hope after this time he's given up, but something tells me that he hasn't. One of the nicest parts about having a large family is when you get to visit them for the holidays. And in 2016, I was going to do just that. At the time, I had been living in Northern California and decided to go stay with my parents for the holidays at their cabin in Colorado. I was planning it as a huge surprise too, and originally, I had intended on just showing up unannounced. But instead, I came up with an idea that I thought would be infinitely better. I was going to show up at the cabin a few days before them, so that when they showed up, I could have it decorated for them. It was going to be amazing. So I figured out that my parents were going to be showing up at the cabin on December 20th of that year and decided to go there two days before them. But to make sure that I didn't accidentally spill the beans, I made sure not to talk to them at all after the 15th to give myself some time to prepare. Now, if I had spoken to them, I would have found out that they had to cancel their flights to Colorado due to a blizzard that was set to hit on the 20th. But I had no clue. And on December 18th, I flew to Colorado and caught a ride to my parents' cabin where I used the key that I had on my keychain to get in. The first night I just relaxed, but the entire next day I spent putting up the lights and setting up the living room to look nice for them when they showed up. But as the sun began to set, I noticed that it was starting to snow outside and I immediately grew concerned. 
It only got worse from there. It was about 1 in the morning when I noticed the power went out around me and I decided to give up on my surprise plan and called my parents to see if there was a generator and as soon as they realized I was at the cabin, they freaked out. But not in the way that seemed like they were excited. They were immediately concerned and let me know that there was a really intense snowstorm heading my way and when I told them that the power had gone out, they only worried more. You see, the driveway leading up to the cabins was a gravel path through the woods that spanned the length of about two football fields. In other words, with the snow piling up the way that it was, there was no way for me to get out. And to make matters worse, I didn't bring much food because I assumed my family would be bringing some. All I could do at that point was hope that the storm passed sooner than expected and I could get out of there. That wasn't the case though. It snowed for five days straight and the service roads leading up to the mountain that I was on had apparently been shut down. My phone's battery was low so I decided to turn it off for use in an emergency and from that moment on, I spent most of my time reading anything that I could. I managed to keep the cabin warm using the wood that I had piled up the night that I got in and I melted snow on the wood stove to make drinking water. But by the time the fourth day rolled around, I was starving. I hadn't had anything to eat in over 48 hours and was getting really desperate. I looked in the cabinets and ended up finding three cans of ravioli that had been in there for years, if not longer. At that point, I would have eaten anything though, so I didn't waste any time putting the can directly on the wood stove to begin heating up its contents. It only took me 10 minutes before realizing how bad of a decision I had made. In no time at all, I was keeled over clenching my stomach in pain. I turned my phone on and called my parents to see if they thought it was serious. And after realizing the food that I had eaten was more than likely more than a decade old, they had me call the hospital which transferred me over to poison control. That's when I learned how terrifying botulism was. According to the person I spoke to, if I didn't get help soon, there was a chance that my body would become deeply infected and I could ultimately die. They ended up sending a helicopter to airlift me to the hospital since the roads were still closed in the area around my cabin and I'm glad they did. By the time they got there, which was only an hour after my call, I had developed a fever over 106 degrees and could feel an intense heat coursing through my body. I was hospitalized for three days afterward, two of which were spent simply monitoring my vitals and making sure that my organs hadn't been damaged. Back in 2017, I worked as a delivery driver for Uber Eats to make some extra money on the side. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was something to help me get by my struggles as a growing adult. I was 25 years old, and I'm sure most of you know how life really sets in at that age. Anyway, I live in the suburbs of New York. Not the city, just the state, as I was never a city person, but lived near it. Throughout my life, I've always been more of a quiet person, which is why I really like the suburban areas. One night, I was doing some late night delivery orders to keep the income flowing when there had been an incoming weather report. The snow had been falling pretty hard and the winds were measuring well over 50 kilometers and that a blizzard was on its way. That being said, I still wanted to do a few more orders for the night. Luckily, I had received one order from someone on the other side of town. It wasn't too far, but this person barely met the delivery radius. I was annoyed because of the distance, but I realized it was another tip. I bit my lip and drove to the restaurant and to the given address. All the while, the falling snow began to come down fast and the winds were starting to pick up. On top of that, the snow on the sidewalks were already starting to pile up, so I knew I had to get there in time. 
I arrive at the destination and there's this man standing outside of his terrace house wearing several layers of clothing. Just by looking at him, he did not seem like a pleasant type of man. It was one of those men that screamed stranger danger. He comes up to my car and I proceed to hand him his food when he begins to ask for some money. I ask him what it was for, to which he then says that his car had been out of gas. Okay, so I wasn't sure why that was my problem, but being nice and not wanting to piss him off, I hand him a $10 bill and wished him luck. He looked down at the money and then looked back at me with a blank expression as if he wanted more. He then said that it wasn't enough and that it could at least do 50 I told him that was all I had, but that maybe someone else could help him. The look on his face that day is something that will never leave me. It was a look of hatred and anger, as if I were his sworn enemy. I then tell him to enjoy and drove off away from the building. Doing that, however, was probably the most stupidest decision of my life. I hear two loud bangs echo through the streets along with something hitting my back tire. It didn't take me long to realize that these bangs were actually gunshots. Suddenly my car swerves from left to right and the ice didn't make it any better. Eventually, I managed to get a hold of the wheel and drive back with my back tire making this awful noise. However, I was afraid of what might happen if I stopped my car in case he was following me somehow. Thankfully, I had gotten home safely just in time and didn't once look back. Police were called and I reported the incident to Uber, but nothing ever became of it. After all, this did happen in the Bronx, which isn't the safest place in the city. I guess I learned my lesson not to assume that everything I do is safe, when in reality, it isn't. It was the fall of 2015 and I just finished my first semester in college, meaning winter break would finally be upon me. I live in upstate New York, and around this time of year, it would become exceedingly cold in my area with temperatures dropping below the 30s. Growing up in the cold, I wasn't bothered by it and actually enjoyed it to a certain extent. One night, my mom had been out with a friend, leaving me to tend to the house alone. I didn't mind staying alone as I like to think of myself as mature and responsible and I could really use the quiet. Now the house we lived in was located in the more rural side of my city. It wasn't like the country but houses here were far apart and the nearest grocery store was about 9 miles. With nothing to do, I throw myself onto my couch and put on some Netflix to fall asleep to. So there I am, bored out of my mind watching Orange is the New Black when the power goes out. Living in a cold area where the winds are strong, it wasn't uncommon for it to go out once in a while. With nothing to do at this point, I close my eyes and try to fall asleep until my parents came home. I probably slept on the couch for about a good two hours when I for some reason wake up. The power is still out so I couldn't see anything in the room other than the faint glow from the moon. However, I started having this weird feeling in the room. You know that sensation you get when you can just feel someone's watching you? Yeah, I had that in spades. I sat bolt upright while letting my eyes adjust to the dark and right then I could see the outline of something tall beside the couch. By some miracle, the power comes back on and about two feet away is a man standing over me. He looked to be in his mid-thirties, was very tall and lanky, wearing a torn white shirt and some cargo pants. 
The thing that made the situation ten times creepier was the fact that parts of his clothes were covered in blood. My blood ran cold as he stared down at me with this menacing glare of utter shock. I say I stared at him for a good ten seconds before he says something along the lines of, Um, who are you? I say in an angry tone, Who are you and what the hell are you doing inside of my house? He then went on to explain that he was driving when his car skidded across the road from the ice, crashing into a large tree, and he came to the nearest house looking for help. It didn't take me long to realize that the blood on his clothes was his. In the heat of the moment, I thought his story was bullshit, but I didn't want to be rude. I tell him that there was nothing I could do and that if he didn't leave I would call the cops. He didn't respond to this and started walking around the living room looking for stuff. Needless to say, I called the police and explained the situation to the operator. They said that it could take a while for an officer to get here due to the extreme weather conditions. I'm 5 foot 8 that weighed around 150 pounds and this guy was massive so I couldn't take him on even if I tried. All the while he's going through cabinets, opening doors and wouldn't listen to me when I told him to stop. I could only assume that he was on something and prayed the police would be here soon. Turns out. His so-called bullshit story turned out to be 100% true. Two police officers came to my door 15 minutes later and told me that he was indeed in a car crash. I felt so bad for him, assuming he was an intruder when the guy was just wanting some help. Apparently, the impact of the crash shocked him to the point where he didn't know what he was doing, which explained him searching through my living room. Long story short, he was sent to a hospital, and me nor my mom pressed any charges. My parents didn't let me stay home alone after that until a few years later. This is by far the most strangest incident I've ever come across in my nine years of living in that house. Even though I felt sympathy for the man, this story still scares me till this day. I'm 22 now and I have moved past it, but there's still one question I have. How did he get inside of my house? The thing is, my parents always keep our doors locked. Many years ago when I was a kid, I used to go sledding with my younger brother every time it snowed. There was a hill at a park a few blocks away, and we could walk to it. Every time it snowed we would go there, and all the kids from the neighborhood would go to it as well. One year when I was about ten, me and my little brother, who was two years younger than me, noticed it was snowing up. It was already nighttime, but as it was a Friday, we knew the next day our local hill would be packed with kids, so we asked our mom if we could go that night. I don't know exactly what time it was looking back, but I'd guess it was about 7 or 8 o'clock. Our mom said we could, but we had to be back within an hour. My brother and I got on our winter coats and snow pants and took our sleds to the hill. It took maybe 10 minutes for us to walk to the park. And as we were walking, the snowfall got heavier and heavier. By the time we got there, it was really coming down, and we saw that there was nobody else at the park at all. The hill was getting coated in fresh snow. My brother and I raced up to the top and then slid down. It was great to have the whole park to ourselves sliding down and going back up over and over again. One of the times when we reached the top of the hill, we noticed a man standing towards the bottom of it. He was really far away but he appeared to just be staring at us. It was kind of weird to see an empty park at night in the middle of a blizzard with just one man standing at the bottom of a hill staring. 
My brother and I decided to wait for a minute or so to see if he would go away before we slid down the hill again. He kept standing there for at least a minute or so, maybe two, and finally walked about 20 feet away and sat on a park bench, but continued to watch us. My brother and I were naturally taught to be careful of strangers, and the guy was seeming suspicious. We decided to slide down the hill one more time and then leave the park to go home. When we got to the bottom, I saw a closer look of the man. He seemed sort of old, but I couldn't make out much else in the snowfall and him wearing a big coat. My brother and I then walked out of the park and left. We walked home in the snow for roughly the 10 minute walk. When we made it back home, we got back inside and had some hot chocolate. After that, we got ready for bed. As I was going down the hallway from the bathroom to my bedroom, I noticed something out the window. The man who we had seen at the park was standing at the edge of our yard on the street, staring at our house. I called my brother over, and just after he got there, we watched the man walk away. He didn't get into a car or anything, he just walked down the street. But after that, he was never seen again. A couple of years ago, I was going on a long road trip for work, which I did quite often with my old job. It was winter time, and as I drove down the road late at night, I noticed it start to snow. Pretty soon, it was a heavy snowfall that was sticking on the ground and causing the road to become very slippery and dangerous to drive on. I hadn't really been paying attention to the weather, but I knew at this point it would be dangerous to continue. I decided to pull off the freeway at the next stop, hoping there would be some hotels or something. Unfortunately, there were none, and the next stop was just a truck stop. I pulled into it off the freeway anyways, and saw a decent amount of trucks and other cars there. The place was starting to get busy from all the snow and the people getting off the roads. I went around and parked in an open parking spot, and decided to just sleep there and wait out the snow. It was a busy road I had been on, so I figured it would get plowed overnight. I went inside the truck stop to use the bathroom, and then walked back out to my car. As I did, I could already see almost an inch of snow had fallen onto my car. I got into my car and began covering up my windows. I did the same thing for whenever I slept in my car. I covered all the windows with certain blankets that I had so nobody could see in the car at all. Then I laid in the back seats of my car, which was just long enough for me to lay down in. I had several other blankets that I had in back with me, so I wasn't too worried about getting cold. I closed my eyes and it didn't take long for me to fall asleep, but I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. I had no idea what time it was. I'd been sleeping well, so I knew something had woken me up. I couldn't see out of any of my windows because of the blankets. Then I heard the sound of a scratching coming from the outside of my car. It got louder and louder. It sounded like it was on my driver's side. It stopped for a minute, but eventually I heard someone try to open the driver's door to my car. I wasn't quite sure what to do because nothing like this had ever happened before. I laid there for about a minute as whoever was there tried to enter my car, testing out each door one at a time. I was really happy that my car was locked. I looked at my phone and thought about calling the police. It was 4.30 in the morning. Then the noises stopped, until suddenly I heard a loud bang come from the back window next to me. Thankfully, the window didn't break, but I thought it might, so I jumped and got into the driver's seat and started the car. I pulled the blanket off the window and drove away. I could feel myself sliding in the snow as I did. I looked in my mirror and saw someone, but couldn't make out anything about them. It was snowy and dark and they were a good 30 feet behind me. I kept driving back onto the road, which was not as slippery as it had been before, but it was still lightly snowing. I slowly and carefully drove up about 20 miles to a town with a hotel and slept there the rest of the night. This happened when I was 15. I was a sophomore in high school and got home from school one afternoon in December to realize I was home alone. I saw a note on the counter from my mom saying that her and my dad were going shopping and would be back later that night. She left me some money to order a pizza, which I was pretty excited about. I did my homework, then ordered the pizza and watched TV. Then I played some video games. It had been snowing earlier in the day, and by the time it was 7 p.m., 
it was really coming down. I kept playing video games, and finally at about 9, my mom called me telling me she was on her way home, but might not be there for another hour or so because of the snow. I decided to go outside and look to see just how much we had gotten. I was also going to maybe shovel the driveway. I stepped out the front door to see several inches of fresh snow everywhere. It was so smooth, except for this one place. I noticed some footprints in the snow that were in my yard. There seemed to be someone who walked in my yard and then went over to the garage. It was strange to me. There usually weren't people walking in my yard. I went back inside and suddenly had the thought to check the garage door which was connected to our house. I went over to it and saw that it was unlocked. I started to walk closer to lock it, but thought I heard a noise right from the other side of it. This really freaked me out and I ran upstairs to my room. I locked my door and hid under my bed. About a minute later, I heard the noise of my garage door opening. I wanted my parents to get home badly, but knew they wouldn't be home for almost an hour. I heard the sounds of someone walking around downstairs in my house. At that point, I decided to call the police. Thankfully, I had my phone on me, and I dialed 911. I spoke as quietly as I could, and hoped whoever was downstairs didn't hear me. I could barely hear them walking around downstairs, and I heard them walking around for quite a while. I had no idea what they were doing, but I was kicking myself for not making sure the garage door was locked earlier. I sat upstairs under my bed until I started to hear the footsteps coming up the stairs. It was the most scared I had ever been, until finally I heard the sound of police sirens off in the distance. The footsteps then went back downstairs and seemed to leave. I waited until the police came inside my house to leave my bedroom. When I did, I saw the main level of our house was all messed up. My parents were called and got home a little bit later. It seemed like just a typical break-in of a guy trying to find valuables in our house. I'm just glad I was able to get upstairs and call the police when I did. My name is Corey, and I lived in the States ever since I could remember. It was around 6 p.m. one night in the winter, and I was staying at my girlfriend's family vacation house due to a snow blizzard. It was our second week there, and the surroundings were astonishing. The house belonged to my girlfriend's grandparents before they passed, and ever since then, we'd always go up there for the winter. Now, the blizzard wasn't too strong, but the snowfall was coming down hard with about two feet of snow. We had just eaten lunch, and after that, I decided I'd go on a walk like I always do. I know, stupid to go out in a blizzard, but it was mild and didn't really pose a threat to us. The house was very close to a forest in the mountains, as this was a more rural part of the state. Going outside and enjoying the cold winter forest looked and felt amazing. My girlfriend had even said she would make us some hot cocoa while I was gone. Now, the forest I normally hike in has two separate paths, one that has a more rocky terrain and one that doesn't. Playing it safe, I decided I'd take the trail with the least amount of treachery as I knew there was a risk of slipping due to the slushy ice. Without hesitation, I go through the more smoother trail and didn't think anything of it. I've been through both of these trails in the past, but I didn't feel like doing anything extreme. So there I was, walking through the woods listening to one of my playlists when my iPod died. Annoyed, I take out my phone and record a few videos of my hike to post on my Instagram story. Not that anyone cared, but I liked recording my experiences wherever I went. It was up until this point that I had been hiking for about a half hour now and was debating on whether to call it a day. However, there had been a small forest clearing just up ahead and decided I'd take a look around. Upon entering the clearing, I immediately noticed strange objects laid out in the snow. The strange part was that they were neatly arranged in a sort of pyramid-like structure. I move a few feet closer, and it was then when I realized that these so-called objects were bones of what seemed like a giant animal. 
maybe cow, maybe a horse, or even buffalo. They were completely clean and sun-bleached. This meant that someone out there had placed these on purpose. What that purpose was, I have no idea. I was just on this trail a few days before and had seen no bones. There were also a few bones that were alike and had been neatly arranged in a circle that laid in the snow. Suddenly, the snow began to pick up as I stared down at the bones when I got the feeling that I wasn't supposed to be here. It was then, when I heard quite a ways into the woods, a loud snap that echoed across the trees. I take a quick photo of my discovery and try my best to run back to the house. All the while, I'm taking big steps into the deep blankets of snow going as fast as I can. I make it back to the house and show my girlfriend the picture I took. She began to freak out as well and we both thought why someone would go through the struggle to do this. I'm still not sure if it was just some punk trying to scare people or something much worse. Either way, I haven't been back up there since, but my girlfriend's parents have. This time, the bones were gone. I live on a remote, quiet street in a relatively small town. For the sake of my safety and privacy, I will not disclose the town as I still live there to this day. It was the last day of school before Christmas break, and like any other ninth grader, I was excited to be home and play the new Call of Duty that was coming out that year. A little background here since I was in the sixth grade, I always walked home. Today was no different. I left school around 2.37 p.m. But this time I had to take a different route home as my street had construction. I remember the shortcut from when I was a little kid that I used to take to school when my road or usual route was blocked or closed due to some reason. I started making my way down the side road as I did years before when I noticed a black Ford following me awful close but doing the speed limit probably to avoid suspicion. I took a few turns to see if this vehicle was following me and sure enough it was. I eventually made it home. And when I did, I told my parents, who then passed it off as being over paranoid. And that was that. Fast forward a few days, and it was Christmas Eve. No sign of that car and no further incidents. Until 11 p.m. rolled around, and we were settling in for bed. I remember doing my routine when my dog started barking. I yelled and said, shut up. I eventually got up and let them out. I want to say eight minutes passed when I was startled out of bed a man screaming in pain outside my window. I looked up to see my dad with a shotgun running outside to the dogs. I rushed out of my bed to the window and just as I got there, I heard my dad yelling at this guy. And then he shot the back of the guy's black Ford speeding down our road. A police report has been filed and it's been four years since the incident. And I'm now finishing school and looking at colleges. The police never found him, and I still sleep with my dogs by my bed, so the man who tried to ruin my Christmas doesn't come back. Christmas Eve with my six-year-old son was one of the most memorable nights of my entire life. Sure, we'd had a bunch of Christmases before that, but being a six-year-old marked the first time that he really started to understand the whole Santa thing. He became completely fascinated with the idea that this fat dude could just like shapeshift down the chimney. Not to mention how he could visit every single child on the planet over the course of one night. He started begging me and his mom to take him to Santa's Grotto so he could meet the man himself. And when it came to leaving out cookies and milk, he insisted on leaving out an entire package of Pepperidge Farm, believing the more cookies we gave Santa, the better his presents would be. It was absolutely adorable and it totally rekindled any of the festive spirit me and his mom had lost over the years. So on Christmas Eve, we leave out the whole bag of cookies, top up Santa's glass of milk and then I take him upstairs to bed. He's way excited about the possibility of Santa arriving which poses something of a problem for me and his mom. If he was still awake when we started putting presents under the tree, he might come downstairs see us eating the cookies and arranging all the boxes, then his festive fantasy would be totally ruined in my mind. We agreed that was totally unacceptable, so 
We waited until like 1am when he was completely out for the count before we dressed the scene like Santa had visited, even including a little note thanking our son for all the cookies, saying he was the most generous little boy he'd ever had the pleasure of delivering to. We were so stoked to see his reaction in the morning, so much so that even we had trouble sleeping that night. But just like our son, the adrenaline subsided eventually and we both drifted off to sleep. The next thing I remember, my son is standing by my bed, shaking me awake and whispering, Dad, wake up, wake up. I can see the little glow in the dark hands of the clock on my bedside table and they're telling me it's just before 5am. So as much as it was obscenely early in my mind, I knew I had to get up if I wanted to see his face when he opened his presents. All this is going through my head and I'm just about getting ready to slip out from under the warmth of the covers when my son says, Dad, Dad, Santa's downstairs. My first move is to look over to my wife's side of the bed, but instead of being downstairs like I thought she might be, she's lying there asleep next to me. I'm instantly struck by this uh-oh moment, thinking that if my son had just heard someone downstairs, like actually heard someone, it obviously sure wasn't Santa Claus. I remember telling my son to wait where he was as I crept towards the doorway, listening out for any sounds coming from downstairs. Believe it or not, it wasn't just his imagination. He was right. I could hear someone downstairs. By this time, his mom had woken up and she's asking what time it is. But all it took was one look from me as I reached for the little lockbox I kept my gun in and she just knew something was wrong. She was just amazing about the whole thing too. Just totally affirmed why I wanted to have children with her in the first place. She just started come to mama, come get a Christmas cuddle, and all this other stuff just completely distracting our son despite him insisting he wanted to go meet Santa. I closed the door behind me, crept towards the staircase, then felt my heart pounding as I started to descend. As soon as I saw the two people crouched down by our tree, I raised my pistol and just growled, Get out of my house! As soon as they heard me, they just bolted back out to the window they'd pried open to get the presents under our tree. I thank God they didn't put up any resistance, that they didn't even say anything before they just jumped out the window. I know of many other confrontations like that where the homeowner came out way worse, and I thank God every single day that I didn't end up as one of them. To me and my partner, it was nothing short of a miracle that the only casualty of that morning was our son's hurt feelings. He was furious that I hadn't let him meet Santa Claus, and no matter how much we tried to explain that Santa was busy and that he couldn't stop to talk, our son cried and cried, all up until we showed him the special note that Santa wrote for him. And that really did the trick, especially once I improvised the idea that Santa had written the note because he was so grateful, even though he was super busy. Now, me and my partner are still wondering how we're going to tell him about that once he's older, we know it'll be something we'll be able to smile about. I mean, no one got hurt, thank God, and I know it'll be funny to see his reaction to the truth, but in that moment, it was just about one of the most terrifying occurrences of my entire life. This took place in 2014 when I was 15 years old and it's probably the most terrifying thing that I've ever encountered. Let me explain. My family and I live in Atlanta, and we'd occasionally drive up north to visit our extended family in upstate Virginia. It is a very long and boring trip there, but it was worth it as we had only gone to see them once a year and we would be staying for a few nights. This year, they had invited us to stay for Christmas as we had never celebrated it with them before and figured it would be a nice day. To cut to the chase, we get there around dinner time on Christmas Eve and everyone was just about done setting the table for us to eat. After we all ate, my uncle proposed to us kids that we go play manhunt out in the backwoods as long as it wasn't snowing too hard. 
For those of you who don't know what Manhunt is, it's basically like hide and seek flashlight tag. Everybody is divided into two teams. One team is the hunters, while the other team were the runners, and whoever the last person standing was got a small prize. Each of us were equipped with a flashlight while my uncle kept a close eye on us. In this case, I was on the runner's team, and my uncle had given my team a good minute to pick a hiding spot. I chose to hide behind an old barrel that was thrown into the woods years ago. Even though it was a little ways into the woods, it was still a great hiding spot. Eventually, my uncle had blown the whistle announcing that the opposing team was coming to find us. I ever so quickly ducked behind this large barrel about a good 25 feet away from the house. After about 5 minutes of hiding, I then began to see that the other team kept on getting closer and closer to my hiding spot, which meant that I had to move quick. I quietly walked into the woods where I was sure they couldn't see me, when I saw the dim glow of an orangish light about 20 or so feet into the woods. At first, I thought that it could have been one of the hunters, but this light wasn't as bright as a normal flashlight and the other team wasn't in the direction of this light. Being the curious kid I was, I started making my way over to it, wondering as to what it could be. My initial thought was that it was a lantern of some type, but I didn't understand as to why there would be a lantern this far out into the woods. Once I got about 10 feet away from it, right then and there, it randomly shut off, allowing me to see nothing but darkness and the light snowfall. I then thought to myself that maybe I didn't need to see what that light was. Suddenly, I begin to hear heavy footsteps in the snow approach me fast from behind. With it being dark outside and still snowing, I couldn't see anyone, so I assumed it was one of the hunters. I ran as fast as I could, a bit more closer to the house where I saw everyone crowded around, including my teammates. I had asked them what was wrong, and all I remember was my dad and uncle telling me to go back inside. When we did, my mom came to tell me and my cousins that there had been a police officer that came up to the door and informed them about a few locals who reported a serial rapist in the area. My blood ran cold as she told us this, and I immediately explained what had happened to me in the woods. Needless to say, we called the police back and they have a team out searching in the backwoods. However, they never did end up finding whoever chased me in those woods, and we never found out what that light was. I haven't been back up there since and neither have my parents, and we don't plan on ever going back up there anytime soon. This story takes place on one of the best nights for kids around America, but one of the worst nights for me. It was Christmas Eve of 2019. For a little backstory, three or four months before this event took place, I broke up with my girlfriend. The event that caused me to break up with her was she stole over $900 from me. I caught her and all she said was, before she left, that this isn't over. Fast forward three months to Christmas Eve. Since we live in Texas and have a house in the hills, every year on Christmas my family usually goes there to celebrate Christmas. However, this year, I couldn't make it because I had to work. This year I was 17 years old and just got a job by a local supermarket and had to work all Christmas Day. I had no problem being home alone. On Christmas Eve night, it was getting late, probably 11 o'clock or so. I decided to take a shower and go to bed as I needed to get up early for the next day. As I started to shower, I heard a strange noise coming from the garage. Sort of like a metallic banging or something dropping. I thought it was some form of a heater because I put the water as hot as I could. I took my shower. When I finished my shower, I went to go to bed and as I did, I heard the noise again. 
although this time it was on the other side of the yard. I was confused because I didn't think there was anything over there. I went to go look outside the window and see. I looked out and didn't see anything but my backyard, completely empty. I completely disregarded it because my backyard is pretty flat and empty, and it has nowhere for someone to hide. Now it's hard to explain, but my window was fairly large, and it has a blind spot to the left where there's a corner where someone could easily hide, but I was tired and didn't think about it. As I walked off, I heard a bang, but this time it was on my window of my house. And as I looked out the window, I saw the figure of a person dressed in all black standing at my window. It made me jump, however, I wasn't too scared as I am fairly a large dude and a high school football player. This all changed when he reached for his pocket for what I assumed was a gun. I ran away from the window toward my parents' room to go retrieve my dad's shotgun. I knew he kept it in the safe and had the safe key under his pillow. As I was running to retrieve this, I dialed 911. As soon as the dispatcher answered, I heard the horrific sound of the glass shattering. I made it to my parents' room and I shut the door quietly. I whispered into the phone what was happening to the dispatcher. She said to stay on the line as the county sheriff was en route, but it would take about five minutes or so. I told her I was going to retrieve the shotgun. She said that's not a bad idea, but only use it if I had to, with caution. I quickly realized my dad took the gun with him because they were going to the gun range. I informed the dispatcher that the gun was gone. She said to make sure to stay on the line. For a moment, everything was silent, and I thought that it may have been a burglar, and they got spooked when they realized someone was home. My heart sank into my chest when I heard not one, but two sets of boots walking up the stairs. I heard a heavy metal pole scraping the floor. I locked and barricaded the door to my parents' room, then I almost passed out when I heard one of them talk. Not in any voice, but my ex-girlfriend's voice. She said, Merry Christmas, Tommy. And I heard a male voice mockingly say, we know you're in there. And he knocked on the door of my parents' room. I almost screamed and got underneath the bed. My ex then said, don't worry if you can't open the door, we'll open it for you. I heard the pole hit the door and the lock falling out of the door to the floor. I had to put my hand over my mouth to keep from being too loud. All of a sudden I heard police sirens and my ex muttering, oh shit. They ran down the stairs to run out the front door when the officer said freeze. I heard a bunch of yelling and then an officer came in and said, if you're in there, make yourself known. I called out to him saying I was Tommy and I called 911. He told me to come out slowly with my hands visible. As I left my parents' room, I saw the two being escorted out in handcuffs. The rest of my night consisted of paperwork and me talking to my parents who were making a three hour drive to come home. This incident was very disturbing to me, and I'm grateful that I reacted the way that I did. Had I not, I might be dead right now. When I was seven years old, my parents offered me a very unusual Christmas present. We were moving into a new house across the country, right around the holidays, and I remember my parents sitting me down and basically asking, if you could choose any other name in the world to call yourself, what would it be? I thought about it for a second, then decided that the coolest first name I'd ever heard was Dexter. No, not because of the fictional serial killer, more because of the old cartoon network show called Dexter's Lab, which centered around the coolest kid scientist in the history of TV. Mom and Dad asked me to really think about it, because I was going to have to use my new name forever and ever. But my heart was set on Dexter's, so that was that. From then on, my parents referred to me only as Dexter, and not by my old name, which was Anthony. It made for an easy transition, and since we were in a new place, people didn't know us by anything else, and it just so happened that our family had a second name too. That would have all been much harder back in Providence, but I was still kind of curious as to why we'd move and changed our names. It's like a Christmas present to ourselves, my mom said. New beginnings can be a gift. And I suppose she was right. I was much happier in our new home, and soon the weirdest Christmas ever was just a speck in the rearview mirror, so to speak. It all started in such a weird way, too. Something I didn't understand at all until many years later. I remember getting off the school bus and walking the short distance back to my house when, all of a sudden, 
I heard a voice calling out to me from a parked car. They were like, Hey! Hey kid! You're Tommy's kid, right? I just nodded. My dad had a lot of friends who all drove fancy cars, so I figured this was another one of his buddies. What? You don't recognize me now? The guy asked me. It's me! Your Uncle Johnny, I was at your communion. I just stared at him nervously, wanting to get inside to get warm, but knowing it would be rude to just walk away. Okay, okay, you're still young, but look, I need you to do me a little favor. The guy continued. I got a Christmas present for your pops here. Make sure he gets it. The guy then produced what looked like a shoebox. Pretty expensive looking thing, too. I remember wanting to open it to see what was inside, but the guy was quick to cut me off, telling me not to look inside, that it was a surprise for my father. You don't want to ruin the surprise, do you? The guy asked, and I responded by shaking my head. As a good kid, now run along and make sure you give it to your father. And remember, no peeking, okay? I was considerably less nervous by that point. I mean, if he had a present for my dad, he had to be a good guy. So I just did as I was told. Took the box into the house, then waited for my dad to get home from work. When he arrived home, I rushed to give him the shoebox. I remember it feeling like it was sort of a gift from me, too. Like if I was delivering it, I was sharing in some of that joy. But when I walked up to him and offered him the box, saying it was from Uncle Johnny, he just said, Who? I repeated that it was from an Uncle Johnny, and Dad still had that puzzled look on his face as he took the box from me, took off the lid, and rustled around the papers inside to see what it contained. Then suddenly, he froze, and I remember watching the color drain from his face like it was yesterday. He slammed the lid back on the box, and when I asked what was in there, Dad just told me to go up to my room. Then as I was walking up the stairs, he started calling out for my mom. And that's how this weird Christmas started. The next morning, mom and dad were piling suitcases into our car while telling me and my sister that we were going to spend the holidays in the countryside because the snow would be better. The next thing I know, we're in a cabin in the middle of nowhere and I'm getting the very unusual Christmas present of getting to pick a new name. The thing is, at that age, it all just seemed totally normal. Or rather, I know something was happening, I just thought it was something that every family did. After a while, we moved into this new house in another state, and this meant that for the longest time, I thought Colorado and Rhode Island were like right next door to each other. It didn't even occur to me that we'd move far away from home, because I couldn't think of a reason why we'd move so far. I remember asking my parents if we're going to change our names the next Christmas, and they told me no, because it'd be hard for all the people in our new town to learn new names, so we'd just be keeping the ones we had. I know it seems crazy, but being so young, I just kind of forgot about the whole thing after a while. Again, I thought it was something every family did at some point, just move towns and pick new names. I thought it was part of the process or something. It didn't make a difference with our parents. Me and my sister just called them the same thing we did before the move, mom and dad. I had a little trouble getting the hang of my sister's new name, but, and I know this is becoming a running theme here, but kids can get used to anything pretty quickly. Then, that was that. For like 11 years, my parents basically covered up what happened to the point where I didn't suspect a thing. I think maybe my sister did, but I definitely didn't. She ended up getting the talk before she moved away to college, and then she was part of this conspiracy too, in cahoots with our parents to keep me in the dark for another three years. And then, right when I was picking colleges come SAT time, they sat me down for the talk too. Some of you might have guessed what the talk consisted of by now, and no, it wasn't the birds and bees talk if that's what you're thinking. The talk was basically my parents explaining to me that the reason we'd moved out to Colorado all those years ago was because my dad was in the witness protection program. He'd never actually been in the mafia himself, he was just an associate, but 
things went wrong for him in a big, bad way, and he was dealing with guys who didn't just cut off business ties. They cut off heads and hands so the cops can't identify you. At least, not right away. But anyway, according to them, the mob guys he was working with had two problems. Firstly, they were convinced someone in their organization was a police informant. And secondly, they had no idea who that person might be. So, in order to flush out the informant, they basically set out a bunch of packages to each of them, all containing something that might scare them into making a move. Apparently, my dad wasn't the informant, but he also had no idea that this was part of a larger scheme to flush the mole out. He thought it was a straight-up accusation and decided to get us out of Providence before any punishments could be meted out. So, ironically, the Mafia had turned a solid earner into an FBI informant, all by just accusing the wrong person. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true or not. When your parents lie to you for almost your entire life, you wouldn't put another couple past them. But it's the version I chose to believe. But what I know for certain is what was in that shoebox I gave to my dad. It was a rat, and someone had hammered a nail through its mouth. I've worked as a mall Santa for the past few Christmases now. I'm only 33, but thanks to my complete lack of exercise routine, I definitely have the figure for it. And once I have the beard and the wig and hat combo going, there's basically no telling the difference between me and a 60-year-old dude. Mall Santa work can be tough for a few different reasons. Number one, the hours are really long and the pay can be really terrible depending on which mall you manage to get employed by. Number two, the kids can be little monsters, and their parents can be just as terrible on occasion too. But the reason I'm actually considering skipping the entire thing this year and having something of a budget Christmas is that you get some seriously disturbing things happening from time to time. I mean, the kind of things that keep you up at night, even after a long, exhausting shift. However, the worst thing that's ever happened to me as a mall Santa was actually nothing to do with kids, parents, or terrible pay and hours, and I'm sure you'll see why after I tell the story. So every year, usually when the malls are quietest during weekday mornings, we get specially organized visits from special needs kids or adults with learning disabilities who are bussed in from the surrounding areas. Pretty much every other mall Santa I've spoken to about this agrees that it can be one of the most rewarding parts of the job, and that the adults with learning difficulties are often even more excited about the prospect of meeting Santa than some of the kids are. Literally the only downside is that some of them are so heavy that my thighs hurt after having like 50 in a row sit on my lap, but other than that, it's honestly one of the best parts of the job. Last year, I'm in the middle of one of the special sessions when I get this girl coming up and sitting on my lap. I say girl, but she was legitimately a grown woman, looking like she was in her mid-thirties or something, but she had the mental age of about nine or ten, all smiles and giggles, way shy about meeting Santa again. It was cute as all get out, but the interaction was not so cute, and turned that way pretty fast. So like I said, she's all giggles and smiles as she comes up to sit on my lap, and I give her the usual spiel, asking her name, how old she is, if she's excited for Christmas and all that stuff. Then, when it comes to asking her what she wants me to bring her on Christmas Eve, she starts thinking about it, smiling at first before she suddenly gets super serious with a touch of sadness. I'm asking her if she's okay, what the problem is, and she's like shaking her head, acting like she doesn't want to tell me anything. I take the time, and explaining that no matter what she asks for, I'll try my very, very best to bring it to her, no matter how big or small it is, that Santa always tries his best to bring good little girls and boys what they ask for on Christmas. She takes a moment, then the exchange goes a little something like this. You mean it, Santa? You can get me anything I want for Christmas? Anything. Anything you want. Just tell me and I'll do my best. Okay, well... And at this point, she lowers her voice to a whisper and leans into my ear. I want my boyfriend to stop hitting me. 
Can you make that happen? I was sort of dumbstruck for a second. Like all of the things I thought she was going to ask, that would most definitely not have topped the list. I remember just nodding at first, trying to find the words and being like, I'll make that happen for you, sure, no problem. She was so, so happy to hear that I'd fix it for her and gave me the biggest hug I think I'd ever received while working as a mall Santa. I had to put on a huge smile and of all the times I've had to fake being jolly and merry, that time with her was the hardest. But I just felt numb, like completely broken by what I'd heard and I just tried my best to get through the rest of the session without bursting into tears. I remember all these thoughts rushing through my head, terrifying ideas of institutional abuse. She said boyfriend and that made it extra creepy. Like sure it could have been just another guy in her care group or something, another adult with learning difficulties who she'd hooked up with somehow, but there was nothing to say that it wasn't a member of her care team that was like abusing her in a completely different sense too. Not just physically, but well, you catch my drift. So when the session was over, I approached the member of the care team that had organized the trip and had accompanied them to the mall. I didn't let anything slip. I just told them how great I thought the session had gone and asked a few details about the group that had organized them. As it turned out, they were all from the same care home type thing, so I made a note of the name of the place as well as the name of the girl that was apparently being abused. That night, I couldn't sleep. I just kept picturing some evil monster abusing that poor girl, taking advantage of their position to put some poor special needs woman through torture, then telling her that she'd be killed if she ever breathed a word of it to anyone. And here's where stuff starts getting even more intense. Now I could have just called 911 with the info I had at hand, registered a general complaint and then heard nothing back about it, but a buddy of mine had a cousin with the local police department and not just some gumshoe beat cop either. They were a detective. It took some convincing, but I convinced my buddy to pass along their cell phone numbers so I could get in touch with the dude personally. It took a little while, but I managed to get through to the guy. He sounded pretty skeptical at first and seemed kind of irritated that his cousin had even given me his number, but once I explained what the issue was, his tone changed completely. Now, I didn't find this out until way later from my friend, but his cousin had a special needs daughter who was probably going to have to either live with them for the rest of their life or was going to head into a group home at some point so she could have some measure of independence. So when I explained the situation with the special needs girl I met as a mall Santa, it obviously hit the guy right in the feels as the topic was so close to home. The detective tells me that he'll look into it, thanks me for letting him know. I get him to promise to tell me if anything comes of it and he says yes and we hang up. And that was the last I heard of it for like a month. Then after maybe five or six weeks, I'd almost forgotten about the whole thing. Christmas was over, the mall Santa job was way behind me, and I was back to working my regular hours as a self-employed mechanic. Then I get a call from a number that seems vaguely familiar, although I wasn't quite sure why. Turns out it was my buddy's detective cousin, who reminded me of the tip that I'd given him about the care company. Of course I remembered, but by that time I really didn't think anything would come of it, but oh how wrong I was. The detective thanks me for the information, and although he told me he couldn't say too much, he told me to keep an eye out on local media outlets. The next thing I know it's all over the local papers that there's been a misconduct scandal involving a local care company. I picked up a copy and read the story, only to find out that it's the very same one I had reported. The long and short of it is that the cops had uncovered endemic levels of abuse in the company, stuff that varied from financial discrepancies to straight-up physical abuse, and sickeningly enough, there was even cases of care workers taking advantage of mentally disabled females in ways that were seriously inappropriate. There were numerous arrests, with some of the sleazier and violent criminals looking like they were going to get years in prison for how long they so cruelly taken advantage of some of the most vulnerable people in society. It made me sick to my stomach to read about how some people could bring themselves to do something like that, but it was stopped. 
and I felt incredible that I'd actually managed to be a part of the chain of events that brought the whole thing crashing down. I just hoped that that poor girl, who was obviously pretty traumatized by what was happening to her, and just not being able to understand why it was happening either, found some measure of peace after it. And in a way, Santa did kind of bring her exactly what she wanted, even if it wasn't on Christmas Day, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a thought that never fails to make me tear up.